Our Island Story, Chapter Fifty Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by Henrietta Elizabeth Marshall. Chapter Fifty Five. Henry the Sixth of Windsor, the Red Rose and the White. You remember that Henry the Fourth, who took the crown from Richard the Second, was descended from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, the fourth son of Edward the Third. But there was some one who had a better right to the throne. That was Edmund Mortimer, who was descended from the third son of Edward the Third. Now, in the time of Henry the Sixth, there was still living a descendant of Edmund Mortimer. He was called Richard, Duke of York. The Wars of the Roses began because Richard claimed to be the rightful heir to the throne. At first, Richard said he only wanted to be made protector of the kingdom because he saw how weak and easily led the king was. It seemed, indeed, as if the king needed a protector, for he was not only weak and foolish, but at times he was quite mad. And unable even to speak for days. The Duke of York hoped that if he was protector during Henry's life, the people would make him king after Henry died. The people would very likely have agreed to this had not a little son been born to Henry. This little son was called Edward, and many of the nobles turned from the Duke of York for his sake. Although Henry was quite unfit to rule, they hoped that his little son would grow up wise and good. And more like his grandfather, Henry V. So some of the nobles sided with the Duke of York, and others with the king, and the quarrelling between them became very bad. Many at first were afraid to speak out and say openly on which side they were, but soon the quarrel grew to be so bitter that not only the nobles but the whole nation took sides. One day, while walking in the Temple Gardens in London with some other nobles, Richard. Duke of York tried to persuade them to join his cause. Ah, he said at last, I see you are afraid to speak out. Well then, give me a sign to show on whose side you are. Let him that is a true born gentleman and stands upon the honour of his birth, if he supposes that I have pleaded truth, from off this briar pluck a white rose with me. Saying that, he pulled a white rose which grew on a bush near and stuck it in his cap. Then the Duke of Somerset sprang forward and, tearing a red rose from another bush, said, "Let him that is no coward nor no flatterer, but dare maintain the party of the truth, pluck a red rose from off the thorn with me." Then one after another, all the nobles who were there plucked red or white roses. Those who were for Lancaster. That is the king, because he was descended from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, wore red roses in their caps. Those who were for the Duke of York wore white roses in theirs. And ever after, during all the years that the wars lasted, red and white roses were the sign or badge of the two parties, and the wars were called the Wars of the Roses. The first battle was fought at St. Albans in 1455 A.D. The White Rose won this battle, and King Henry was taken prisoner. The Duke of York treated Henry very kindly, and as he became quite mad for a time, the Duke ruled the country. The next year, however, the King recovered from his madness. He sent the Duke away, and once more ruled the kingdom himself, or rather, it was the Queen who ruled. For she was very fond of power, but did not care in the least to do what was best for the people, so she was greatly hated, and it was not long before war again broke out. This time too, the White Rose was successful. Queen Margaret fled to Scotland with her little son, and Henry was again taken prisoner. The Duke of York now claimed the throne in earnest. He entered London in great state. Trumpets were sounded. The sword of office was carried before him, and he was followed and surrounded by a train of soldiers and servants. He rode straight to Westminster, where Parliament was sitting, and did not pause until he reached the House of Lords. 
There he marched up to the throne, and laid his hand upon the cloth of state with which it was covered, as if he meant to show that he had taken possession of it. But he did not sit on the throne. He stood for some time in silence, looking at the empty seat, keeping his hand still upon the cloth. Then turning he looked at the nobles, as they crowded before him. Still silent he stood wondering, and as if asking himself, Are they glad or sorry to see me? Then in the silence the Archbishop of Canterbury stepped forward. My Lord Duke, he said, will you come to see the King? The Duke of York drew himself up proudly. I cannot remember, my Lord Archbishop, he said, that there is any one in this kingdom who should not rather come to me than I go to him. Then he turned, and boldly sat upon the throne. Sitting there, the Duke made a long speech to the lords. He reminded them that Henry the Fourth had taken the crown by force, and tried to show that he, the Duke of York, had a better right to the throne than Henry the Sixth. Therefore, he said, according to my just and free title, I have and do take possession of this royal throne, and, with God's help, I shall keep it for his glory, my own honour, and the good of all my people. When the duke had finished, there was a deep silence. The lords sat as if struck dumb. In their astonishment, they seemed afraid even to whisper or utter one word. It is good, said the duke at last, that you should think well of what I have said. And rising, he went away, not very pleased at their silence, yet not quite displeased either. He went to the royal palace, took possession of Henry's own rooms, and lived there more like a king than a duke. Left to themselves, the lords and the commons, after a great deal of talking, decided that, while Henry lived, he should still be called king, but that the Duke of York should be protector, and that when Henry died, the Duke should be the next king. Henry, who was weak and idle, was quite satisfied with this. So was the Duke, for he was a wise man who really loved his country. He meant to rule well, and hoped in this way to become king without further fighting. But Queen Margaret was very angry. She loved to rule, and she hated the Duke of York, and she would not be ruled by him, nor have her son set aside for him. She came from Scotland, where she had been hiding with her little boy, and gathering an army, fought another battle with the Duke of York and his followers. It was a terrible battle. This time the Red Rose won, and the Duke of York himself was taken prisoner. After the battle was over, the Red Rose soldiers set the Duke on a little mound. They crowned him with bulrushes, and then knelt before him, crying, Hail King without rule! Hail King without heritage! Hail Duke and Prince without people or possessions! And after this cruel mocking of a helpless prisoner, they cut off his head. The wicked Queen Margaret laughed with joy when she saw it, and, to mock the dead man still further, she placed a paper crown upon the head, and stuck it upon the walls of York. One of the Duke's sons, a pretty boy of only twelve, was killed too. He was trying to run away with his tutor, when he was caught by one of the Red Rose soldiers. "'Oh, please, please do not kill me!' sobbed the boy, the tears running down his cheeks. "'I do not want to die!' But the soldier had a cruel heart, and would not listen. Dumb with fear, the poor little boy fell upon his knees, holding up his hands to beg for mercy. But the soldier had no mercy. "'Your father killed mine,' he cried. "'I will kill you.' So the poor little boy died. Queen Margaret had no mercy either. She seemed mad with revenge. She killed as many of the White Rose nobles as she could, and the White Rose cause seemed lost. But although Richard, Duke of York, was dead, he had a son called Edward, who now became Duke, and the head of the White Rose party, and more terrible battles were fought. The people hated the Queen for her cruelty and her wickedness. She had no money with which to pay her soldiers, so she allowed them to plunder, and they too were hated and feared wherever they went. 
the gates of London were closed against them, the people refusing to give them even the plainest food. But Edward of York was young, brave, and handsome, and when he came to London with his army the people threw open the gates to him, welcoming him as their king. Then the Bishop of Exeter, standing up among the great crowds who had gathered to meet him, reminded the people of all the cruel wrongs which they had suffered during Henry's reign. "'Will you have him still to rule over you?' he asked. "'No, no!' shouted the people. "'No, no!' "'If you will not have Henry, whom will you have?' asked the bishop. "'Will you serve, love, honour, and obey Edward, Earl of March, and Duke of York, as your only king and sovereign lord?' "'Yes, yes!' shouted the people. "'King Edward! King Edward! Long live King Edward!' So, with shouting and cheering and clapping of hands, the people chose Edward of York to be their king. End of chapter 55 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On July 13, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story Chapter 56 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 56 Edward IV. The Story of Queen Margaret and the Robbers it was in 1461 A.D. that the people chose Edward IV as their king. And so there were two kings in England, Henry VI, the head of the Red Rose, and Edward IV, the head of the White Rose Party. There could be no peace in the country, so long as there were two kings, each claiming the throne. So, without waiting to be crowned, Edward marched to meet the Red Rose army and to fight for the crown. On a bleak day in March, the two forces met at Towton in Yorkshire, and fought amid a wild storm of wind and snow. For ten hours the battle raged. The white snow was stained, and the river which flowed near ran red with blood, till it seemed as if the earth and the sky had taken sides with the red and white roses. Never since Hastings had such a terrible battle been fought on English ground. The white rose was victorious. Henry's cause seemed utterly lost, and he and his wife and their little son fled to Scotland. If Henry had been left to himself, he would have given up fighting for the crown, for he loved quiet and peace. But Queen Margaret loved power, and would not rest until she had again won the kingdom. She got help from the French king, and in three years was back in England once more. But Edward and the great Earl of Warwick, who had helped to put Edward upon the throne, were too strong for Margaret, and she was utterly defeated. Without a single friend or servant, Margaret and her little son, who was now about eleven years old, fled into the forest to hide. The night came on, it grew dark, and they lost their way among the winding paths. Hungry and tired, they did not know which way to turn. Afraid to stop, afraid to go on, starting and shrinking at every sound, they clung to each other trembling. Presently they heard men's voices, and saw the glimmer of a fire. Margaret whispered to her little son to be very still, as they crept near to find out who these people were, whether friends or enemies. Hidden by the trees, the queen and her little boy came quite close to the fire, and stood listening and watching. In a few minutes they found out that these men were robbers. Holding the prince tight by the hand, Queen Margaret made ready to run away. But suddenly one of the robbers looked toward them. He saw the glitter of jewels in the firelight. With a cry he made a spring at the queen, and in spite of her screams and struggles she was dragged into the circle round the fire. "'Aha! What have we here?' cried one robber. "'A fine prize, truly,' said another. 
"'Here is gold enough,' said a third, roughly pulling at the chain round Margaret's neck. "'Come, lady, we will have all these things,' he went on, pointing to her jewels. The queen began to take off her rings and jewels, for she was very much afraid. But one robber pushed the other aside. "'Let be,' he said. "'The prize is mine. I took her.' "'Nay, nay, share and share alike. "'It is mine, I say. "'I took her, I say. "'It is mine.' "'So the robbers began to quarrel fiercely about the treasure. "'And while they quarrelled, "'Margaret took the prince in her arms and ran away. "'Where she ran she did not know. "'On and on she went, "'stumbling through the dark forest. "'At last, breathless and weary, "'unable to go another step, "'she sank down on a grassy bank.' Scarcely had she done so when another robber appeared. Seeing no escape, Margaret went towards this robber, putting the little prince into his arms. Friend, she says, take care of him. He is the son of your true king. The hard, rough man, accustomed only to murder and rob, felt sorry for the poor, tired lady and her little boy. He held the prince in his arms, saying, Lady, I will not hurt you. "'Come with me, and I will show you where you can rest safely.' The robber led the queen and prince through the forest till he came to his secret cave. There he fed them, and kept them safe for some days, and at last took them to the shore, where they found a ship in which to sail over the sea. But King Henry was not so fortunate. He escaped, and hid in various places for nearly a year but he was discovered at last and taken prisoner to London. As he rode a prisoner into the city, he was met by the Earl of Warwick, and the poor unfortunate king was made to ride through the streets like a common criminal, with his feet tied under his horse. Then he was shut up in the Tower of London. End of chapter 56「Our Island Story」Chapter 57 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 57 Edward IV The Story of the Kingmaker Edward the Fourth now felt quite sure of the throne, and he married secretly a beautiful lady called Elizabeth Woodville. When this marriage became known, the Earl of Warwick was very angry, because he thought the king should have married someone more great and powerful. The Earl of Warwick himself was so great and powerful that he was called the Kingmaker, and he had done much to make Edward king. Edward soon acted in many ways which displeased the Earl, and they quarrelled, and plots were formed to drive Edward from the throne. Among the people who plotted against him was the Duke of Clarence, King Edward's own brother. At last the Earl of Warwick became so angry with Edward that he took him prisoner, and shut him up in a castle called Middleham. So there were two kings in England, both of them prisoners. The kingmaker, having made and unmade the king, now ruled the country himself for a year. He really had intended to make the Duke of Clarence king, but he found that even he was not powerful enough to do that. In about a year's time Warwick set Edward free again, and, strange to say, they made up their quarrels, and were friends once more. But in a very short time they again quarrelled, so badly this time that the Earl of Warwick, who had fought so hard for the White Rose of York, forsook it, and joined the Red Rose of Lancaster— He went to France, where Margaret and her son were, and offered to help them to conquer England, and place Henry again on the throne. So one morning Edward awoke to hear the Red Rose war cry, and two friends, running into his room, begged him to fly. For, they said, even in your own army we know not who is true and who is false, many like Warwick having turned traitor. Hardly waiting to dress, without money or armour, Edward threw himself upon his horse, and rode as fast as possible to the coast. There he found some ships, 
and with a few friends and two or three hundred faithful soldiers, he sailed over to Holland. They were very poor, had no money nor goods nor indeed anything except the clothes they wore. Edward, who had one day been King of England, Wales, and Ireland, found himself the next a homeless, penniless wanderer. And Warwick, in little more than a week, had deposed the king whom he had helped to set on the throne, and had placed Henry the Sixth once more there. Henry was brought out of prison and dressed in beautiful robes, and, riding upon a splendid horse, was led through the town, while the people cheered and shouted, "'God save the king! Long live King Harry!' Did he remember that the last time he rode through the same streets it had been as a wretched prisoner, bound and disgraced by the very man who now set him again on the throne? And did he remember that the people, who now cheered, had then cursed and laughed at him? Although Henry was once more on the throne he could not rule. He was like a wooden doll in the hands of a clever man such as the Earl of Warwick, and it was the Earl and the Duke of Clarence who ruled. Henry would have been far happier had he been left alone to his books and prayers. He loved peace, yet he was made the cause of war by the proud and powerful men and women around him. Edward had been obliged to fly from the country, penniless and almost friendless, yet he did not despair. He persuaded the Duke of Burgundy to help him, and soon returned to England with an army. No sooner had he landed than people began to flock to him. By the time he reached Barnet, near London, he had a large army. Many who had joined Warwick now forsook him and returned to Edward, among them Edward's own brother, the Duke of Clarence, who brought twelve thousand men with him. There seemed to be no faith nor loyalty in those days. It was hard to know who was friend and who was foe. At Barnet, on Easter Day, 14th of April, 1471 A.D., another terrible battle was fought. What made it more terrible was that it was begun and ended in a thick mist. In the white dimness which wrapped both armies, it was difficult to know the red roses from the white, and indeed at one time the red roses fought against themselves. King Edward's men wore a golden sun embroidered upon their coats. The Duke of Oxford's men, who were fighting for King Henry, wore a golden star. In the midst, the Red Rose soldiers, mistaking the star for the sun, attacked the Duke of Oxford's men, thinking that they were King Edward's men, and killed many of them. From dawn to midday the battle raged. Then the Earl of Warwick's army broke and fled, leaving the White Rose victorious. The great king-maker was found dead upon the field, and Edward the Fourth was once more king. On the very day of this battle, Queen Margaret and her son, who was now about eighteen, landed in England. They had hoped to find Warwick victorious and Henry on the throne. Instead they found Warwick dead, his army shattered, and Edward on the throne. But Margaret was as bold as ever. She marched through England, gathering soldiers as she went, and at Tewkesbury another great battle was fought. Here again the Red Rose was utterly defeated, and Margaret and her son were taken prisoner. Prince Edward was led before King Edward. The king looked fiercely at the young and handsome prince. He hated him more than he had ever hated his poor, weak, gentle father. "'How dare you come into my kingdom to stir up my people to rebellion?' he asked. "'It is not your kingdom, but my father's,' replied Prince Edward proudly. "'You are a traitor. I should sit where you are. You should stand before me as a subject.' Then King Edward, pale with rage and hate, struck the boy in the face with his steel-gloved hand. The dukes of Clarence and Gloucester, the king's brothers, dragged the prince away, and stabbed him to death. Queen Margaret was put in prison, and a few days later King Henry died mysteriously in the Tower of London. Many people thought that he was murdered by King Edward's brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. At last it seemed as if all Edward's enemies were either dead or in prison, and that he might really rule in peace. 
the Red Rose party was for the time utterly crushed. Some of the great nobles even were seen barefoot in rags, begging for bread from door to door. Edward never quite forgave his brother, the Duke of Clarence, for having at one time sided with Warwick. Clarence, too, was jealous of the Queen Elizabeth and her relatives, many of whom had the chief posts at court, so he quarrelled with them and with his brother the King. At last an old wizard prophesied that someone whose name began with G would bring about the death of King Edward and the ruin of his house. The Duke of Clarence was called George, and King Edward made the prophecy an excuse for shutting him up in the tower. He never came out again. It is supposed that he was murdered, some say by being drowned in a cask of wine by the order of his brother, the Duke of Gloucester. Edward IV died in 1483 A.D. He was brave, but cruel and revengeful, handsome but wicked, caring little for the happiness of his people, and his reign was dark with many battles and murders. He had ruled for twenty-two years, during twelve of which King Henry still lived. End of chapter 57 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On July 13, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story Chapter 58 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story Chapter 58 Edward V. The Story of the King Who Was Never Crowned when Edward the Fourth died, his eldest son was only thirteen, but the people willingly chose him to be king. The young Prince of Wales, now Edward V, was living at Ludlow Castle with his uncle, Lord Rivers. When the news of his father's death was brought to him, he at once set out for London, accompanied by his uncle and some gentlemen. On the way he was met by another uncle, Richard of Gloucester, who was a wicked, hard-hearted man. He sent Lord Rivers and his friends to prison, and himself took charge of the young king. Edward was very fond of Lord Rivers, and was afraid of his ugly uncle Richard. He cried when Lord Rivers and his friends were taken away from him. That did no good, but the poor little king was only a boy, and he did not know what else to do. When the Queen heard of what happened, she was so frightened that she ran away from the palace in which she had been living, taking her daughters and her other little son, who was called Richard, with her. She ran to Westminster Abbey, and there took sanctuary. As Hubert de Burr did, you remember many years before, in the days of Henry the Third. The Duke of Gloucester had the young king in his power, but he was not satisfied with that. He wanted to have Prince Richard too. Queen Elizabeth, however, would not give up her little boy, who was only ten years old, and the Duke of Gloucester, bad though he was, was afraid to take him by force, because he was still trying to pretend to be a good, kind uncle to the little boys. At last the Duke sent a bishop to the Queen to try to persuade her to give up her little son. The bishop said everything he could think of to make her do so, but all in vain. "'My little boy has been ill,' said the Queen. "'He is not well enough yet to leave his mother.' "'Ah, lady,' said the bishop, "'tis not kind to his brother the king to keep him here. "'They should be together, so that they could play with each other.' "'Oh, surely some other little boy could play with the king,' said the Queen. "'Little boys, even if they are kings, "'do not ask that their playmates should be princes. "'I cannot, I will not, let my little boy go.' "'Let him but come to me, and I will guard his life as my own,' said the bishop. At these words, the queen stood for a long time, thinking silently. It seemed to her as if she must give up her boy sooner or later. It would be better to give him to the kind bishop, who would perhaps keep him safe, than to his wicked uncle. So, taking the prince by the hand, 
she led him to the bishop. "'I know you are faithful and true,' she said. "'You are strong and powerful, too. "'And, oh, for the trust his father put in you, "'I now charge you, guard my boy.' "'Then, kneeling beside her little son, "'and putting her arms round him, "'she held him close to her heart. "'Farewell, my own sweet son,' she said. "'God give you good keeping. "'Let me kiss you yet once before you go, "'for God knows when we shall kiss together again.' Then she kissed him, and blessed him, and kissed him again, and again, and at last, crying bitterly, put him into the arms of the bishop, and turned her face from him. But weeping as bitterly, little Richard clung to her, and would not go, until the bishop, taking him strongly in his arms, carried him away. The bishop led the prince straight to his uncle, who was very glad to see him. His ugly face shone with joy as he took his nephew in his arms and kissed him. "'Now welcome, my lord,' he said. "'With all my heart you are right welcome.' King Edward, too, was very pleased to see his brother, for they had been parted for a long time. The duke led them through the streets with great pomp and put them into the tower. Now that the Duke of Gloucester had both the princes in his power, he began to show his wickedness. He sent to the prison in which Lord Rivers and his friends were imprisoned, and ordered their heads to be cut off, because he knew that they were the Queen's friends. Then he called a council to arrange, he said, about the coronation. Only a very few lords were asked to this council. When they were all gathered together, he came into the room, seemingly very much disturbed. What should be done to people who try to murder me, he asked. At first... Every one was so astonished that no one spoke. Then Lord Hastings, who was a brave man and true to the king and the queen, his mother, said, If anyone has tried, he deserves to be punished, whoever he is. The queen has tried with her sorcery, cried the duke, and others have helped her, and pulling up his sleeve, he showed his arm, which was all puckered and withered. In those days it was believed that people had power to hurt their enemies by saying wicked words and rhymes and wishing evil to them. It was thought that people could even kill others who were quite far away, and who they could not even see nor touch. This was called sorcery. Of course it was a very foolish belief, and everyone knew that the Duke of Gloucester's arm had always been withered up. But when he said that the Queen had done it by sorcery, no one dared to contradict him. There was silence in the hall, till Lord Hastings said, If the Queen has done this... You answer me with ifs and ands, cried the Duke. You are a traitor, a traitor, I say. And with that he struck his hand upon the table. Immediately soldiers rushed into the room. Seize him, he said, pointing to Lord Hastings. Cut off his head. My Lord, said Hastings, I am no traitor. You are a traitor, yelled the Duke and by heaven I will not dine till I see your head cut from your body. Obey your orders, he added, turning to the soldiers. Lord Hastings was hurried away, and without being allowed to defend himself, without a trial of any kind, he was made to lay his neck upon a rough plank of wood, which happened to be at hand, and his head was at once cut off. So another of the king's friends was dead. The Duke of Gloucester, next made a clergyman called Shaw preach to the people and tell that the little princes were not really the sons of King Edward the Fourth and his queen, and that therefore they had no right to the throne of England. Our true king, said this wicked clergyman, is Richard, Duke of Gloucester. Then he waited, expecting every one to cry out, King Richard, King Richard, but there was not a sound. The people stood as if they had been turned into stone. Pale and trembling, they went away to their homes, wondering what would happen next. The clergyman, too, went home. He was so ashamed to have preached such a wicked sermon that he never again showed himself to the people, and died soon after. The Duke of Gloucester was very angry and disappointed when he heard of the bad success of his wicked plans, but he did not give them up. He again gathered a lot of people together, and this time... His friend, the Duke of Buckingham, talked to them. The Duke of Buckingham said much the same things as the clergyman had said. When the people heard these wicked lies for the second time, 
they began to whisper among themselves, till it seemed as if a swarm of buzzing bees filled the hall, but not a single person shouted King Richard. And then some of the Duke's servants and friends came into the hall, and they shouted, King Richard, King Richard, long live King Richard, but the cry sounded very feeble, for they came from only a few. The Duke of Buckingham, however, pretended that all the people had shouted for King Richard. He thanked them, and he and his friends went to the Duke of Gloucester, and told him that the people had chosen him as their king, and were cheering and shouting for King Richard. Richard then pretended to be very unwilling to take the crown, and only consented to do so after a great deal of persuasion. This was all a part of his wickedness and cunning. Richard was crowned with much splendour and grandeur, and poor little King Edward, who had never been crowned at all, and who had only been called king for a few weeks, was kept shut up in the Tower of London. End of chapter 58 Our Island Story, Chapter 59 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 59 Richard the Third. The Story of the Two Little Princes in the Tower. When Edward was told what his uncle had done, he was very sad and very much afraid. Oh, he said, I hope my uncle will not take my life as he has taken my kingdom. From that day he became sorrowful, and did not seem to care about anything. He did not even trouble to dress himself properly. Richard took away all the little prince's servants, and left them only one man called Black Bill. He was rough and rude, but even he loved the gentle little boys and tried to comfort them, for, shut up in one room with nothing to do, the days seemed very long and dreary. But although Richard was king, he could not be happy. He could not forget the little princes in the tower. As long as they lived, he knew that some day the people might drag him from the throne and make one of them king instead. So he determined to kill Edward and his brother. King Richard sent a message to the governor of the tower telling him to kill the princes, but the governor refused to do the wicked deed. Richard, however, could always find men bad enough to do what he wanted. He sent a bad man now to the governor of the tower, commanding him to give up the keys of the tower for one night. The governor was forced to obey the king, but he did so with a sad heart. That night the little princes went to sleep with their arms round each other's necks, each trying to comfort the other. They lay together in a great big bed, happy in their dreams, with tears still wet upon their cheeks. As they slept, two men crept softly, softly up the dark stair. Quietly they opened the door and stole into the room. They stood beside the bed, hardly daring to look at the two pretty children, in case the sight might soften even their hard hearts, and they would be unable to do the cruel deed. Then they seized the clothes and the pillows, and pressed them over the faces of the little boys. They could not scream, they could not breathe. Soon they lay still, smothered in their sleep. Then these wicked men took the bodies of the two little princes, and threw them into a hole which they had made under the staircase, covered them over, and fled away. There the bodies were found many years later. Now that Richard had murdered the rightful king and his brother, he was no happier. Terrible dreams came to him at night, so that he could not sleep. By day he thought that people were ever ready to kill him, and his hand was almost always on his dagger. The people hated him, and he knew no rest nor peace. He tried to make good laws, so that the people might forget his wickedness, but it was no use. They hated him in spite of all he could do. Plots against Richard soon began. Even the Duke of Buckingham, who had helped him in his wickedness and put him on the throne, turned against him. The people longed for another king, and their thoughts went out to Henry Tudor, Duke of Richmond. You remember that Queen Catherine, the widow of King Henry V, married a Welsh gentleman called Owen Tudor. 
This Henry Tudor was her grandson, and he was also descended from John of Gaunt. He belonged to the House of Lancaster, and had fought for the Red Rose. Henry of Richmond was at this time living in France, but he now gathered an army and came over to England. But before he came, Richard had already fought the Duke of Buckingham. He defeated him, took him prisoner, and then cut off his head. When Henry heard that, he went away again. But he soon came back. This time, as soon as Henry landed, people flocked to him. Noble after noble deserted Richard, and joined the Red Rose party. In 1485 A.D. a great battle was fought, called the Battle of Bosworth Field. This was the last of the Wars of the Roses, and in it King Richard was killed. He fought well, for although he was small and deformed, he could fight. His horse was killed under him, but he still fought on foot. In the middle of the battle Lord Stanley left the king, and, with all his followers, joined Henry Tudor. Seeing that the battle was lost, some of his nobles begged Richard to fly, but he would not. "'I will die a king,' he said, and so he fell in the thickest of the fight. As he fell, the crown which he had worn over his helmet rolled away under a hawthorn tree. There it was found by Lord Stanley, who set it upon Henry Tudor's head, and, on the battlefield with the dead and dying round, the soldiers shouted, "'King Henry! King Henry! Long live King Henry!' The place is still called Crown Hill to this day. Richard III had reigned two years, two months, and one day. "'And it was twenty-six months and twenty-four hours too long,' said a man who lived about that time, and who tells his story. End of chapter 59 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on July 17, 2006 in Oceanside, California. Our Island Story Chapter 60 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story Chapter 60 by H. E. Marshall Henry the Seventh, The Story of the Make-Believe Prince With Henry Tudor, a new race of kings began to reign in England. For more than three hundred years the kings of England had been Plantagenets. Henry the Second was the first of the Plantagenets, and he took his name from Geoffrey of Anjou, who used to wear a piece of Plantagenista in his cap. With Richard the Third, the last of the Plantagenets died, for Henry the Seventh, though a Plantagenet on his mother's side, was a Tudor on his father's side, and it was from his family that Henry took his name. The Tudors were Welsh, and claimed to be descended from the ancient British princes, who, you remember, were driven into Wales when the Saxons took possession of England. The Battle of Bosworth Field was the last of the Wars of the Roses. Henry Tudor, who was the Red Rose Prince, married Elizabeth, the daughter of Edward IV, and sister of the little princes who were murdered in the Tower. She was the White Rose Princess but by marrying Henry she became the Red Rose Queen, and the differences between the House of Lancaster and the House of York, between the Red Rose and the White, ought to have been quite forgotten. But Henry himself could not entirely forget these quarrels, which had been so bitter. There were many people in England who still belonged to the White Rose Party. Although they had hated Richard, they were not pleased to see a Red Rose King upon the throne. So. Henry the Seventh was hardly crowned before rebellions against him began. Soon after Henry the Seventh was crowned, a handsome boy and a priest landed in Dublin. This boy called himself the Earl of Warwick. He was, he said, the son of that Duke of Clarence, brother of Edward the Fourth, who was murdered in the Tower by being drowned in a cask of wine. The priest, he said, was his tutor. Ever since the death of his father, the Earl of Warwick had been kept a prisoner, but now, he said, he had escaped in some wonderful manner. 
The simple Irish people believed this story. They knew nothing of Henry, and had no reason for either hating or loving him. But they did love the House of York, for the Earl of Warwick's grandfather had at one time governed Ireland in the name of the King, and having governed well, the people remembered and loved him. So now they welcomed this young prince with great joy. Edward, Earl of Warwick, as he called himself, was gay and young and handsome, and he gained the love of the Irish so much that they resolved to crown him king. This was done with great rejoicing in Dublin, but they had no crown. So the priest took the golden crown from the statue of the Virgin Mary, which was in the church, and put it upon the boy's head. Then, wearing this crown and dressed in beautiful robes, the new king was carried through the streets on the shoulders of the great strong Irish chieftain, while the people shouted, Long live King Edward the Sixth. Having been crowned in Ireland, Edward the Sixth thought he would next conquer England. So he sailed the Irish Sea and landed in England with a small army of wild Irishmen and Germans. Meanwhile, Henry the Seventh had heard of these doings in Ireland and had not been idle. He brought the real Earl of Warwick out of the tower, where he had been kept a prisoner ever since he had been quite a tiny boy. Dressed in fine clothes and riding upon a splendid horse, the real Earl was slowly led through the streets of London, from the tower to St. Paul's and back again. By another way he was led so that all the people might see him. The young Earl had spent all his life in prison. It must have been quite a wonderful thing for him to come out into the open streets, to see the blue sky and the houses and the trees, the great procession of soldiers and knights in a glittering armour and gorgeous clothes, and the people, men, women and children, crowding in the streets all eager to see him, and having been led out, having seen for once all the life and stir of the great city, the poor young prince was taken back again to his dull, quiet prison, while the king marched with his army to fight the pretended earl. The two armies met at a place called Stoke. Very few English had joined the pretender, for they were quite sure that the earl whom they had seen riding through the streets of London was the real earl, and that this one was only a make-believe. The pretender's soldiers were soon defeated, for most of them were wild Irishmen, badly armed and wearing no armour. They were no match for Henry's well-armed and well-trained soldiers. The pretender was taken prisoner, and so was the priest who was with him. They confessed that the prince was no prince at all, but a boy called Lambert Simnel, the son of a baker. The priest, who was a Yorkist, or White Rose man, hated Henry, and finding that the boy Lambert was clever as well as handsome, he taught him how to behave as a prince ought. He told him stories of the Duke of Clarence and of Richard III, so that he might pretend to be what he was not. Henry did not kill Lambert Simnel, as many kings who reigned before him would have done. Instead, he gave him a punishment, which had Lambert indeed been a prince, would have been a very dreadful one. He was sent into the king's kitchen to be a scullery boy, and to help the cooks. This boy, who had worn a crown and royal robes, who had been carried through the street shoulder high while the people cheered him as their king, was a few days later turned into a kitchen drudge to be ordered about by the cooks, and set to do the meanest kinds of work. But Lambert Simnel behaved himself so well, that the king soon took him out of the kitchen, and made him a kind of page. He had then to look after the king's falcons. All great people kept falcons in those days. They were used for hunting, and were trained to fly up in the air to catch and kill other birds. A great deal of time and money was spent on falcons. They had hoods of velvet and jewels, and gold and silver chains. Lambert must have found his new work much more pleasant than helping the cooks in the hot kitchens. The priest, who had taught Lambert Simnel, was allowed to go free, but some of the nobles who had helped him were beheaded, and others were made to pay large sums of money. End of chapter 60《Our Island Story》Chapter 61 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island: A Story by H. E. Marshall, Chapter Sixty One. Henry the Seventh, the story of another make-believe prince. A few years after the rebellion of Lambert Simnel, there was another which lasted longer and was more serious. A second handsome boy, even more handsome, gay, and princely than Lambert Simnel, landed in Ireland. He was, he said, Richard, Duke of York, the younger of the two little princes who had been smothered in the tower by order of their uncle Richard. It was quite true, he said, that his brother Edward V had been killed, but the wicked murderers had not been cruel enough to kill them both, and he had been saved. For seven years he had been wandering about the world from place to place. Now he had come to claim his own again and take the throne from Henry. This story was not true. The boy's real name was Perkin Warbeck, but like Lambert Simnel. He had been taught to tell these lies by the enemies of Henry, who hoped in this way to drive him from the throne. Although the Irish had already been deceived once, they believed Perkin Warbeck, and many people promised to help him. The French king, who was quarrelling with Henry, invited him to come to France. There he was kindly treated, and more help was promised to him. But Henry, who always avoided war when he could, made peace with France. And the French king, although he would not betray Perkin to the English king, sent him out of France. When he was obliged to leave the French court, Perkin went to Margaret, Duchess of Burgundy. This lady was a sister of Edward the Fourth. She hated Henry the Seventh so much that she was glad to hurt or annoy him when she could. She had helped Lambert Simnel, and now she welcomed Perkin as her nephew. She said that he was very like his supposed father, Edward the Fourth, and she called him the White Rose of England. Just as Henry had taken trouble to prove that Lambert Simnel was a false earl, now he took trouble to prove that Perkin was a false prince. He sent spies to the places where Perkin had been born and had lived till now, and made sure that he was really Perkin or Peterkin Warbeck. Then he found the two men who had killed the princes in the tower. They confessed to the murder, but they were not punished for it, perhaps because Henry thought they had not been so much to blame as Richard the Third, who had made them do it. But in spite of all this, many people believed in Perkin, the King of Scotland, not that King who had been kept prisoner for such a long time in England. Believed in him so much that he not only helped him with soldiers, but married him to his cousin, a beautiful lady called Catherine Gordon. Like Lambert Simnel, Perkin was crowned, and his followers called him Richard the Fourth. The rebellion went on for about five years. Battles were fought now and again, but Perkin was never successful. His beautiful wife Catherine went everywhere with him. She at least believed in him and loved him. At last, hearing that the men of Cornwall were angry with the king because he had taxed them too heavily, Perkin decided to try his fortune there. He landed in Cornwall, left his beautiful wife at St. Michael's Mount, where she might be safe, and marched to besiege Exeter. But the people of Exeter were true to the king and would not yield. So Perkin grew tired of besieging a town which would not yield, and he marched away to Taunton. There, hearing that Henry was coming against him with a great army, he took fright and ran away in the night. Next morning, when Perkin's poor soldiers woke up and found that they had lost their leader, they had no heart to fight. Some of them ran away like Perkin; others gave themselves up, begging the king to forgive them. They were all gathered together in a churchyard at Exeter, their heads and their feet bare, and ropes around their necks. King Henry came to a great window and looked down upon them. When the people saw him, they all fell upon their knees, begging for pardon. There were so many of them that the king could not punish all. So he spoke to them and, warning them not to rebel again, said he would forgive them all except the ringleaders, who should be put to death. Then, with a great cry of rejoicing and thanks, the people threw the ropes from their necks and went to their homes. 
Henry sent to St. Michael's Mount for the Lady Catherine, Perkin's beautiful wife, and when she was brought before him, blushing and trembling and fearful of the rough soldiers, the king felt so sorry for her that he treated her as a royal guest. He gave her a guard of honour and sent her to London to the court of his Queen Elizabeth. There she lived for many years, loved and admired for her beauty and her gentleness. She was so lovely that she was called the White Rose of England, the name which the Duchess of Burgundy had given to her cowardly husband. Meanwhile Perkin had taken sanctuary at a place called Bolio. Henry would not seize him while he remained in sanctuary, but he kept such a close watch that Perkin could find no way of escape, and at last gave himself up. Henry would not see nor speak with Perkin, but made him ride in his train to London. When they arrived there, all the people came out into the streets to see the wonderful man who had pretended to be a prince, and who had made people believe in him for so many years. Perkin was even more fortunate than Lambert Simnel had been. He was neither put in prison, nor was he made a servant. He was allowed to live at court like a gentleman, although there were guards always with him, who had orders never to lose sight of him. Perkin might have spent the rest of his life in peace, but he soon grew tired of being watched, and one day he managed to run away. But he did not run very far. Henry's soldiers were too quick for him, and once more Perkin gave himself up. This time Henry punished Perkin by putting him into the stocks for two whole days, first at Westminster, and then at Cheapside. He also made him read a paper aloud, in which he confessed that the story he had told was not true, and that he was not the Duke of York. In those days people were often punished by being put in the stocks. They had to sit in a very uncomfortable position, with their feet through holes in a board. It was uncomfortable, and painful also, and was considered a great disgrace. Little boys, and grown-up people, too, used to hoot and yell at those in the stocks, and pelt them with mud, rotten eggs, and other disagreeable things. After Perkin Warbeck had been in the stocks for two days, Henry shut him up in the tower. There he met the Earl of Warwick, the real Earl, not Lambert Simnel. These two prisoners were allowed to talk together, and soon they formed a plot to kill the governor of the tower and escape. But the plot was found out, and that put an end to Perkin Warbeck, for Henry, thinking that he was too dangerous to be allowed to live any longer, ordered his head to be cut off. The poor Earl of Warwick was also put to death. This was a needless and cruel act, for the Earl alone was too simple to harm any one. Indeed, he was so ignorant of the world and the things in it, that it was said he did not know the difference between a hen and a goose. Except for the wars which these pretenders, Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, caused, the reign of Henry the Seventh was very peaceful. One reason for that was that Henry was greedy, and he knew that wars cost a great deal of money. Once, indeed, he got money from the people in order to make a war against the French, but as soon as he got it he made peace, and kept the money for himself. The people were very angry, but Henry as a king was far more powerful than the Plantagenets had ever been, and the people had to submit. One reason why the Tudors were such powerful kings was that, during the Wars of the Roses, nearly all the nobles were killed— the king took all the money and lands which had belonged to these dead nobles, and so he became very rich. Being rich, he did not need to ask Parliament for grants of money, so the people became less powerful. Indeed, during a great part of Henry's reign he called no Parliament, which shows how much he had of his own way. About this time two very wonderful things happened which made a great difference throughout the world. One was the discovery of printing. The other was the discovery of America. Up to the time of Edward IV, books had all been written by hand, and they were so dear that only a few rich people could buy them. But when a clever man called Caxton brought the art of printing to England, books became cheaper, and people began to think more about learning 
and less about fighting. Then Columbus discovered America. That, too, made people think less about fighting, for they gave up quarrelling about little bits of the old world, and turned their thoughts to exploring the wonders of the new world, as Columbus called the land he discovered. End of chapter 61 Read by Kara Schallenberg on July 24, 2006 in Oceanside, California. Our Island Story Chapter 62 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story Chapter 62 by H. E. Marshall Henry the Seventh, The Story of the Field of the Cloth of Gold Long before Henry the Seventh died, in 1509 A.D., all the joy and love which the people had felt for him when he came to the throne had faded away. He had proved to be a hard and greedy king, and no one was sorry when he died. His son was also called Henry, and he was only eighteen years old when his father died. He was gay and handsome, and the people believed him to be generous and good, so there was great rejoicing when he was crowned. Henry's chancellor was a man called Wolsey. He was a very great man, and for many years it was really he who ruled England. Wolsey was the son of a butcher. Being a clever boy, he was sent to school, and afterwards to college at Oxford. There he showed himself to be so clever that people soon began to notice him, and he quickly rose from one post to another until he became chaplain to Henry the Seventh. Henry the Seventh found Wolsey very useful to him. He became one of Prince Henry's greatest friends, and when Prince Henry became king, he made Wolsey Chancellor and Archbishop of York, and heaped upon him many other honours and posts, until he was almost as rich and as great as the king himself. Wolsey had most splendid houses, and about five hundred servants, all of whom wore most beautiful clothes. His cook even wore a satin or velvet coat, and had a gold chain around his neck. Wolsey himself dressed most gorgeously in bright red silk or satin, and he wore gilded shoes set with pearls and jewels. Whenever he went out, there was a great procession. A man carrying a mace walked first, then came two gentlemen carrying silver wands, then two of the biggest and handsomest priests that could be found, each carrying a great silver cross. Then came Wolsey, mounted upon a mule. He rode upon a mule because, he said, being a humble priest, it was more fitting for him than a horse. But the harness and saddle were of velvet and gold, and behind him came a long train of his servants, and followers on splendid horses. Henry the Eighth was fond of magnificence and show, and it pleased him to have so fine a chancellor. Henry was gay, and the chancellor was gay. If Henry were sad, Wolsey would joke and laugh until the king laughed too. If Henry were merry, Wolsey would be merry with him. Soon people began to see that if they wanted anything from the king, it was best to make friends with the chancellor. Wolsey, on the whole, made good use of his power. He was fond of learning. He saw that without learning no country could be truly great, and he founded a school at Ipswich, which was his birthplace, and a college at Oxford. If he tried to make himself great, he also thought of England, and how to make England great. The first few years of Henry's reign were peaceful and quiet. Henry the Seventh had been a very rich man when he died, so Henry the Eighth had plenty of money and at first the people were not troubled with new taxes. Henry pleased everyone by marrying a rich and beautiful lady called Catherine of Aragon. She was a widow, having already been married to Henry's elder brother, who was called Arthur. Arthur would have been king had he lived, but he had died a few months after his marriage with Catherine. After Arthur died, Henry the Seventh kept Catherine at the English court, in the hope that his second son, Henry, would one day marry her. This he now did. 
although it was then, and still is, against the law for a man to marry his dead brother's wife. However, as Henry thought it was a wise thing for him to marry Catherine, he asked the Pope to give him leave to do so, and the Pope, whom you know was a very powerful person, gave him leave. In those days people were never long content to be at peace, and Henry soon began to fight with France and with Scotland. In a battle called Flodden, the Scots were defeated, and their king killed, and Henry made peace with the Queen, who was his own sister. Soon afterwards he also made peace with France. Henry then decided it would be wise not only to be at peace with France, but to make friends with the French king. So the great Chancellor, Wolsey, arranged for a meeting between Francis I of France and Henry VIII of England. This meeting took place on a plain in France near a little town called Guine, and everything about it was so splendid that it was called the Field of the Cloth of Gold. A palace for the English king was built so quickly that it seemed like a magic thing. It was only made of wood, but it was so painted and gilded that it shone and glittered in the sunshine like a fairy palace. Great golden gates opened into a courtyard, where a fountain sparkling with gold and gems flowed all day with red and white wine instead of water. This fountain bore the motto, Make good cheer who will. The palace walls were hung inside with cloth of gold and silver. Everything was rich with embroidery and sparkling with gems. Wherever possible gold and jewels shone, the queen's footstools even being sewn with pearls. When the French king saw Henry's splendid palace, he did not wish to be outdone. He set up a great tent, the centre pole of which was a gilded mast. The tent was lined inside with blue velvet, the roof was spangled with golden stars, and a golden sun and moon shone night and day. The outside was covered with cloth of gold, and the ropes which held it up were of blue silk and gold. The tent looked very grand, and glittered in the sunshine like a ball of fire, but when everything was ready, a terrible wind arose, which snapped the ropes of silk and gold, broke the mast, and brought the blue velvet sky with glittering stars and golden walls to the ground. So Francis had to content himself with living in an old castle, which stood not far away, and very likely he was far more comfortable there than he would have been in his golden and blue tent. When all was ready, King Henry and Queen Catherine sailed from England, and with them a great company of nobles, each trying to be more splendid than the other. The two kings met on the plain near Henry's palace. They were both dressed in gold and silver cloth, and rode beautiful horses with harness of gold and velvet. While still on horseback, they embraced and kissed each other. "'My dear brother and cousin,' said Francis, "'I have come a long way to see you. I hope you will think that I am worthy of your love and help. My great possessions show how powerful I am. Dear cousin, replied Henry, I never saw a prince with my eyes that I could love better with my heart. And for your love, I have crossed the seas to the furthest bounds of my kingdom in order to see you. Then the kings got off their horses and arm in arm walked to a gorgeous tent nearby where a very fine dinner was prepared for them. For three weeks there were gay times. Grand tournaments were held in which the kings fought with the knights, and the kings always won. There were balls and feasts, too. Sometimes the kings and queens and lords and ladies dressed up and disguised themselves, so that no one could tell who was who. This, they thought, was the greatest fun of all. The English people were very fond of wrestling, and the soldiers used to amuse themselves in this way. Henry was fond of all kinds of games and sport, and one day, while watching the soldiers, he proposed to King Francis that they too should try a wrestling match, and laughingly laid hold of his collar. Francis was quite pleased, for although he did not look so strong as Henry, he was very quick and wiry. Soon the two kings were struggling together, and in a few moments Henry was lying upon the ground, he sprang up with a laugh and wanted to try again, but the nobles who stood round persuaded him not to do so. They were afraid that what had begun in fun might end in a quarrel if Francis should again throw Henry down, 
for Henry had a very fiery temper. Francis felt, too, that in spite of all the show of friendship, there was no love between the French and the English. This was hardly to be wondered at, for they had been such bitter enemies for so long a time that it was hard to forget all at once. Francis himself, however, was really generous, and wished it really could be forgotten. One morning Francis rose early, and without telling any of his nobles, he rode quite alone to the English camp. Henry was still in bed when King Francis came into his room, and said, laughing, "'My dear cousin, I come to you of my own free will. I am now your prisoner.' Henry was very pleased to see that Francis trusted him so much, that he was not afraid to come quite alone like this. He sprang out of bed, and threw a chain of gold around the French king's neck. In return, Francis gave Henry a beautiful bracelet, and then laughing and joking like a schoolboy, he insisted on helping Henry to dress. He warmed his shirt, helped him to tie and button his clothes, and then, mounting on his horse, rode gaily home. When he came near his castle, he was met by some of his nobles, who were anxiously looking for him. Francis laughingly told them what he had been doing. Sire, said one of them, I am very glad to see you back again, but let me tell you, master, you are a fool to do what you have done. Our luck be to him who advised you to do it. Well, that was nobody, replied Francis. The thought was all my own. In spite of the fears and jealousy of the French and English, the meeting came to an end as peacefully as it had begun. Henry sailed home again with all his gay knights, but many of them were quite ruined and penniless. They had spent all their money on fine clothes and jewels, so anxious were they to make a great display and be grander than the French. But all this splendour and show of friendliness meant nothing and came to nothing, for Henry, both immediately before and after this meeting with Francis, met and plotted with Charles, the Emperor of Germany, who was the enemy of Francis. When war again broke out, the English fought against the French, as they had always done. End of Part 62 Our Island Story, Chapter 63 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall, Chapter 63 Henry the Eighth. How the King Became the Defender of the Faith and how the great cardinal died. In the reign of Henry the Eighth, the Pope was still the head of all the Christian Church, although, as long ago as the time of Edward the Third, a man called John Wycliffe had begun to preach and teach against his rule over the English Church. Wycliffe translated the Bible from Latin into English, and encouraged the people to read it. His followers were called Lollards, and they helped the people at the time of Wat Tyler's rebellion, in the reign of Richard the Second. The heads of the church hated the Lollards, and Henry the Fourth, who wanted to please the priests, made a law, saying that any one who would not believe just what the Pope said he must believe should be burned to death. This was a very wicked law, and it marked the beginning of another struggle for freedom in England, that is, the struggle for freedom of conscience, which means freedom to think and do what one feels to be right in matters of religion, instead of being forced to think and do as someone else says is right. For some time now very little had been heard of the Lollards, but the things which Wycliffe had taught had not been forgotten. After printing was discovered, and books became cheaper, people began to read, and, in consequence, to think much more than they had done before. The more people read and thought, the more difficult some of them found it to believe just what they were ordered to believe by the Pope. It was not only in England that this was happening, but in many other lands as well. In Germany a monk called Martin Luther, after thinking a great deal about it, decided that some things which were done in the Romish church were wrong. He was brave enough to say what he thought, and— in spite of the anger of the Pope and the priests, a great many people followed Martin Luther, and left the Roman Catholic Church. 
This is the beginning of what is called the Reformation. That is a long word, but it is quite easy to understand. It is made from two Latin words, re, again, and formare, to form or make. It means that the people who left the Roman church again formed or made the church. These people were called Protestants. The word Protestant is also made from two Latin words, pro, publicly, and testari, to bear witness. So a Protestant really means someone who openly and publicly bears witness, or protests. We can hardly understand how bold and brave a thing these Protestants did. Now everyone is free to believe what they think is best and right, but in those days people who could not agree with the Pope were cruelly punished or put to death. Now Protestant churches and Roman Catholic churches stand side by side, and we do not kill and hate each other because we worship God in different ways, but in those days nothing caused such cruel suffering and such bitter hatred. When King Henry heard what Martin Luther had done, he was very angry. Being a clever man, and proud of his learning and knowledge about religion, he wrote a book against Martin Luther and his teaching. This book he had bound most beautifully, and then he sent it to the Pope. With great splendour and ceremony, dressed in his most magnificent robes, and sitting upon his throne with all his priests around him, the Pope received Henry's messenger. The messenger knelt humbly, presenting the book, and kissing first the Pope's toe, and then his cheek. Afterwards the messenger made a long speech, and the Pope made a long speech, and so the ceremony ended. When the Pope had read the book, he was so pleased with it, that he gave the King of England a new title. He called him Fidei Defensor, which means Defender of the Faith. He wrote a letter to Henry, thanking him for his book, and calling him, Our most dear son Henry, the illustrious King of England, and Defender of the Faith. Henry was very proud of his new title, and he held a solemn service in the church at Westminster, when the Pope's letter was read, and the King's new title proclaimed. Afterwards Henry quarrelled with the Pope, but he kept the title of Defender of the Faith, and it has been borne by the kings and queens of England ever since, although the faith they now defend is no longer the faith of the Roman Catholic Church. If you look at some of the coins which we use now, you will see F.D. or Fid Def upon them. These letters mean Fidei Defensor, or Defender of the Faith. King Henry quarrelled with the Pope because he would not let him put away his wife, Queen Catherine. Queen Catherine had done no wrong, but she was some years older than Henry, and now that he had been married to her for nearly twenty years, and she was no longer young and pretty, he had grown tired, and wanted another wife. Henry was very selfish. He thought a great deal of his own pleasure, and always wanted to have his own way. Years before, when he wished to marry Catherine, he had made the Pope give him leave to do so, although it was against the laws of the church, because, as you remember, she had already been married to his brother Arthur. Now Henry began to think, or pretended to think, that he had been wrong ever to marry her at all, and he tried to make the Pope say so. Wolsey, whom the Pope had made a cardinal, tried very hard to make him say so too, but in vain. After a long time the Pope sent another cardinal to England, and a great trial was held, to decide whether Henry should be allowed to put away his wife or not. Many wise men were gathered together with the king and queen, the two cardinals, and their priests and clerks. When the queen's name was called, she rose from her chair, but although she tried to speak, she could not. She stood a moment, then, crossing the hall to where the king sat, she threw herself at his feet. "'Sir,' she said, "'I pray you do me justice and right, and take some pity upon me. For I am a poor woman, and a stranger, born out of your dominion. Alas, sir, how have I offended you! I take God to judge that I have ever been your true and humble wife. I have been glad for the things which have made you glad, and I have been sorry for the things which have made you sorry.' 
Your friends have been my friends, your enemies my enemies. I have loved for your sake all whom you have loved. I have been your wife these twenty years and more. If there be any just cause for the anger you have against me, I am content to depart in shame and rebuke. If there be none, then I pray you to let me have justice at your hand. With that she rose up, and making a low curtsy to the king, she walked proudly out of the court, a most unhappy woman, but a grand and dignified queen. The king sent messengers after her to call her back, but she would not return, nor did she ever again come into the court. The cardinals and the wise men talked for a long time, but they could not decide whether Henry might be allowed to send his wife away or not. The fact was, the Pope was afraid of Henry on the one hand, and of the Emperor of Germany, who was Catherine's nephew, on the other, and dared say nothing. Then Henry grew very angry and impatient, and blamed Wolsey. Perhaps Wolsey had something to do with the delay, for, although he did not love Queen Catherine, and would have been quite glad to have had her sent away, he hated Anne Boleyn, the lady whom Henry now wished to marry. Anne Boleyn hated Wolsey too, and little by little she so turned the king against his old friend that he took many of his offices from Wolsey, and in the end sent him away from court. When Wolsey was sent away he went to a house which he had in the country, a sad and worn-out man. He loved power, but he loved England too, and in all he had done he had thought of making England great in the eyes of the world. With his wise counsels he had done much for England, and yet the people hated him. The nobles hated Wolsey because he was proud and haughty. They could not forget that he was a butcher's son, and yet they knew that, although Henry ruled England, Wolsey ruled Henry. The common people hated him because when Henry needed money it was Wolsey, his chancellor, who had to wring it from the poor. So they looked upon him as the cause of all their sorrows, and there were few who mourned, and many who were glad at his fall. Henry next accused Wolsey of treason, and sent for him to come to London to be tried. Worn with sorrow and sickness, the cardinal started on his journey, but when he reached Leicester he was so ill that he could go no further. "'Father, I am come to lay my bones among you,' he said sadly to the abbot, who came to welcome him when he arrived at the abbey of Leicester. It was true, for in a few days the great cardinal lay dead. "'Had I served my God as faithfully as I have served my king,' he said before he died, "'he would not have cast me off in my old age.'" End of chapter 63 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On July 26, 2006, in Oceanside, California Our Island Story Chapter 64 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 64 Henry VIII The Story of the king's six wives. After the death of Wolsey, Henry chose a wise and gentle man, called to Thomas More to be his chancellor. As the Pope still refused to give Henry leave to send Catherine away, he resolved to do so without leave. He sent her away, married his new wife Anne Boleyn, and, because the Pope, as head of the church, had refused to allow him to send Catherine away, he announced that the Pope had nothing more to do with the Church of England. Henry told the people that in future they must look upon the King of England as head of the Church as well as of the State. The Pope was very angry with Henry, and threatened him with all kinds of punishments, but Henry did not care. He had done what he wished to do, and was no longer afraid of the Pope. Soon it began to be seen how wise Wolsey had been, for now that Henry ruled without him, 
he became a much worse king than he had been before. Some good and wise men, among them the Chancellor Sir Thomas More, felt that Henry had been wrong to quarrel with the Pope. They would not acknowledge him as head of the church, so Henry first put them into prison, and then he cut off their heads. The king soon tired of Anne Boleyn, and when people told him that she was a wicked woman, he was quite willing to believe them. He put her into prison, and presently cut off her head. The very next day he married another lady called Jane Seymour. This lady was good and gentle, but she did not live very long after she was married to Henry. He was very sad at her death, and for two years he did not marry anyone else. At the end of that time he married a fourth lady. She was called Anne of Cleves. Henry had never seen her, as she lived in Germany, but he had seen a picture of her, painted by a famous artist called Holbein. In it she looked very pretty, and Henry said he would marry her, because Thomas Cromwell, who was his chief adviser at that time, told him that it would be a wise thing to do. But when the lady came to England, Henry found that she was not in the least like her picture. She was not at all pretty. She was very clumsy and awkward, and could not speak a word of English. Henry flew into a great passion, rudely called her a great Flanders mare, and vowed he would not marry her. He was, however, obliged to do so. He was afraid if he did not, he might have to fight the German princes, who were her friends. But in revenge, he put Thomas Cromwell into the tower, and cut off his head, because he had advised this marriage. Henry soon got rid of his new wife. He offered her a large sum of money, if she would go away and let him marry another lady. Anne was quite pleased to do this. No doubt she was glad to get away with her head safe upon her shoulders, from such an angry, passionate man. About a fortnight later, Henry married another lady, called Catherine Howard. This time the king soon discovered that he had married a wicked woman, she was not any more wicked than Henry was himself, but he did not think of that. To punish her, he cut off her head, and the heads of several of her friends as well. About a year later, Henry married his sixth and last wife, a lady called Catherine Parr. She was a good woman, and it is wonderful that she should have been willing to marry so bad a man, and one who was so fond of cutting off the heads of his wives. Perhaps she thought that Henry might cut off her head if she refused, and after all it was a fine thing to be called Queen of England. Catherine Parr was clever, and she managed to keep her head upon her shoulders, and although Henry once thought of cutting it off because she did not quite agree with him about religious matters, although Henry had quarrelled with the Pope, he did not wish England to become a Protestant country. He wished the people to remain Roman Catholics, but to look upon him instead of the Pope as the head of the church. So he beheaded and burned the people who tried to follow the teaching of Luther, and he also beheaded and burned those who still looked upon the Pope as the head of the church. Yet Henry helped on the Reformation, for he gave an order that a Bible should be placed in every church, so that people might go there and read it, and as books were still very dear, these Bibles were chained to the desks, in case people should be tempted to steal them away. Henry the Seventh had left a great deal of money when he died, but Henry the Eighth was so extravagant and reckless that he soon spent it all. He tried many ways of getting more money, and after he quarrelled with the Pope, he thought of a new way. All over England there were monasteries and convents, in which men and women lived who gave up their lives to good works. They cared for the sick and the poor, taught the people how to read and write, and did many other useful things. Some of these monasteries and convents were very rich, possessing land and jewels, beside much money. Henry said that the people who lived in these places led wicked lives. No doubt some of them did, but many of them led good lives, and brought great comfort and happiness to the poor around them. But because of the evil which some did, 
Henry shut up these monasteries and convents. He sent the people who had lived in them out into the fields and streets, homeless wanderers, and took all their money and lands for himself. Besides doing this, Henry taxed the people very heavily, and at last they rebelled. It was a curious rabble-like army, which gathered together an army of peasants and weavers, led by priests and monks, carrying their sacred banners and crucifixes. They called their rebellion the Pilgrimage of Grace. Who is your leader? asked the Duke of Norfolk, who had been sent against them. Our leader is poverty, they replied, and we are driven on by necessity. Although the king was not well prepared, the rebels did not succeed. The Duke of Norfolk persuaded them to go home, promising them pardon in the king's name. They went home, but the following year the rebellion broke out again. This time the king's soldiers were better prepared. The rebels were defeated, many of them being taken prisoner and put to death in cruel ways. Henry the Eighth died in 1547 A.D., having reigned for nearly 38 years. His reign was a great one for England, the country becoming more important among the kingdoms of Europe than it had ever been. But Henry himself was bad and selfish and at the end of his reign, at least, proved himself to be a cruel tyrant. End of chapter 64 Our Island Story, chapter 65 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 65 Edward the Sixth The Story of a Boy King Henry the Eighth had three children. They were called Mary, Elizabeth, and Edward. Edward was the son of Lady Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife, and was the youngest of the three. But for several reasons he was made king. Edward was only nine years old, and his uncle, Lord Somerset, was made regent, or protector. Lord Somerset was not a strong man, and did not rule well. He wished to be powerful, and tried to make himself king in all but name. His brother, Thomas Seymour, also wanted to rule, so there were plots and quarrels between them, and between the other great nobles. Although Henry the Eighth had quarrelled with the Pope, he never became a Protestant, nor did he wish the religion of the country to be changed. But Lady Jane Seymour had been a Protestant, and so was her brother, who was now protector. Edward the Sixth had been brought up in the new religion, and although he had very little power, he wanted the country to become Protestant. But this was not the wish of the whole people. Many of them did not like the new English service which the king ordered to be used in the churches. It was like a Christmas game, they said, and they asked for the old Latin service called the Mass, to which they were accustomed. When Henry the Eighth shut up the monasteries, he brought great distress on the poor in many ways. He gave some of the monastery land to his friends, and these gentlemen, growing greedy, began now to add to their possessions by enclosing with fences the common lands, which before had been free to every one. The poor had been allowed to feed their cows and sheep on these common lands, but now that they were enclosed by fences the sheep and cows died from hunger, and the poor people were worse off than ever. Those who had been turned out of the monasteries were all Roman Catholics. They were now homeless, and went among the people, telling them that all their sorrows were because of the change of religion. At last the people rose in rebellion, many of them hardly knowing why, but only feeling that they were very unhappy. But the rebellion was soon crushed, and the ringleaders put to death. It is told how the provost marshal wrote to one man, the mayor of Bodmin, who was known to have been one of the leaders, saying that he was coming to dinner. The mayor was very glad, thinking that he was not to be punished for his share in the riots. He made ready a splendid dinner, and received the provost and his friends with great politeness. "'Mr. Mayor,' said the provost, "'I have to hang a man in the town after dinner. Will you have a gallows set up?' 
the mayor gave the order to the hangman, and then they sat down to dinner. They were all very gay and merry, and when the meal was over, the provost took the mayor by the arm, saying cheerfully, Come now, let me see these gallows. The mayor led him to where they were set up. Do you think they are strong enough? said the provost. Oh, yes, replied the mayor. I can assure your lordship they are quite strong enough. Very well, said the provost. You shall go up and try, for you are the man that is to be hanged. You do not mean that, my lord, you are joking, said the mayor. Nay, but I do mean it, said the provost. Up you get. You have been a busy rebel, and now here is your reward. And in spite of all he could say, the poor mayor was hanged upon his own gallows. But the people rose again and again. One of the chief rebellions was under a man called Ket. He was a tanner. A great many people gathered round him, and they camped near Norwich on a plain, in the centre of which stood a great oak tree. This tree they called the Oak of Reformation, and under its branches Ket held his parliament and court, deciding quarrels, making laws, and punishing wrongdoers. Ket encouraged his followers to pull up the hedges, throw down the fences, and fill up the ditches with which the common lands had been surrounded. Otherwise they behaved in a wonderfully orderly manner. They did indeed steal sheep and cattle from the rich gentlemen round, so that they might have plenty to eat in the camp. But Ket ordered his men not to hurt any honest or poor people. He called himself the king's friend, and said he fought only against the wicked lords who gave him bad advice. For some time the protector did nothing, and Ket's army grew larger and larger. Lord Somerset was sorry for the people. He knew that they were very poor, and felt that they were badly treated. Yet he knew, too, that he ought to do something to put down the rebellion. At last a royal herald came. Dressed in his coat embroidered with the arms of England, he stood under the oak of reformation, and blew his trumpet, and— while the people gathered round to listen, he cried, "'All ye good subjects of King Edward the Sixth, by the grace of God, defender of the faith, King of England, attend!' Then he told them that he had been sent to say that King Edward would pardon them all, if they would go quietly back to their homes. Many of them would have done this, but Ket said, "'No, pardon is for rebels. We are no rebels.' We are the true subject of the king, and only wish to prevent him from being evilly advised. So he would not go home. The protector had gathered an army, intending to make war on Scotland, and this army he now sent against Ket and his men. There was a good deal of fighting. Many people on both sides were killed, the town of Norwich was taken and retaken, but in the end Ket was defeated. He and his brother were made prisoners with many of their followers. They were put to death, and nine of the chief rebels were hanged upon the branches of the Oak of Reformation. As time went on, the quarrelling among the nobles grew worse. The office of protector was first taken from Somerset, and he was then beheaded. Many of the common people were sorry for this, because they believed that Somerset had really been their friend, and they loved him, although the nobles hated him. Lord Somerset was succeeded by the Duke of Northumberland. The Duke of Northumberland was also a Protestant, and he was quite as fond of power as Somerset had been, and began to make plans to get the crown of England into his hands. Edward had never been strong, and Northumberland knew that he was not likely to live long. The next heir to the throne was Mary, Edward's elder sister. She was the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, the first wife of Henry the Eighth. Princess Mary was a Roman Catholic. She hated the Protestant religion as much as Edward loved it. It made Edward sad to think that, when he was dead, Mary would undo all that he had done, and that England would again become Roman Catholic. Northumberland knew this, and he persuaded Edward to make a will, leaving the throne to his cousin, Lady Jane Grey. Of course, Edward had no right to do this, but he did do it. Lady Jane Grey was the great-granddaughter of Henry the Seventh, 
and she was married to the Duke of Northumberland's son. She was very young, being only about sixteen, and the Duke thought that if she were queen he would be able to do just as he liked. He tried to keep his plan secret, for he knew that many of the people wished Mary to be queen. He succeeded so well that even Lady Jane herself did not know what he intended to do. In 1553 A.D., soon after Edward had made his will, leaving the crown to his cousin, he died. He was a good and gentle boy, fond of books and learning. During his short reign many schools were founded. They still exist, and are called King Edward schools. Edward was very anxious to do what was right, but like his father Henry the Eighth, he was also fond of his own way. Had he lived to be old enough really to reign, he might have proved to be a good king. But it is hard to tell, for while he lived he had little real power. End of chapter 65 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On July 26, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story Chapter 66 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story Chapter 66 The Story of Lady Jane Grey As soon as King Edward VI was dead, Northumberland, with several other nobles, went to Lady Jane Grey, and offered her the crown. They knelt to her, kissing her hand, and greeting her as their queen. It was a great thing to be Queen of England, but Lady Jane was not glad. She was sad and frightened. She trembled as the Duke spoke to her. Then, covering her face with her hands, she fell fainting to the ground. When she came to herself again, she cried bitterly for sorrow at the death of her cousin, whom she had loved dearly. She was only a very little older than he, and like him she was fond of learning. Indeed, they had often had the same masters. Lady Jane was even more clever than Edward. She could speak and write Greek and Latin, and she knew some Hebrew. This was more wonderful in those days than it would be now, for then very few people had any learning at all. As Lady Jane wept for her cousin, the nobles tried to comfort her, by reminding her how great she herself now was. But that did not comfort her. It frightened her. "'I cannot be queen,' she said. "'I cannot bear so great an honour. I am not fit for it.' "'It is your duty,' said the Duke. "'You cannot put away from you the duty God gives you.' With tears running down her face, Lady Jane fell upon her knees, and clasping her hands, said, Then, if it must be so, God give me strength to bear this heavy burden. God give me grace to rule for his glory and the good of the people. The next day, Lady Jane was taken in state to the tower, but no crowds gathered to greet and cheer her as their queen. A few people came out of idle curiosity, but they were all silent. Not one voice cried, God save the Queen. But while these things were happening, the Princess Mary did not sit still. She raised an army and claimed the crown. Northumberland marched against her with another army, leaving Lady Jane in the tower. No sooner had he gone than many of the lords who had joined him in helping to put Lady Jane on the throne began to regret it. They, one and all, declared for Queen Mary, and marching to the tower, demanded the keys in her name. Lady Jane's father, who had been left to guard the tower, was afraid to resist, and he opened the gates to Mary's friends. Then, running to his daughter's room, he told her that her reign was at an end. "'Dear father,' she said, "'these are the happiest words I have ever heard since you told me that I must be queen.' "'May I go home now?' she added. "'But alas, it was easier to enter the tower than to leave it, 
and she was kept fast prisoner. Meanwhile, Mary had been proclaimed queen in the streets of London. Instead of the gloomy silence which had greeted Lady Jane Grey, the people shouted with joy, God save the Queen! God save the Queen! The news spread fast, the church bells rang, the people sang and shouted, bonfires were lit, everywhere there was feasting and rejoicing. Mary was Queen. The news travelled on. It reached Northumberland and his army. The Duke knew that when he heard it that his cause was lost, that his hopes and his fortunes were fallen and broken. Only one thing was left to him. He too took off his cap and shouted with the rest, God save the Queen! Poor Lady Jane, the ten days Queen, was forgotten. But even that could not save Northumberland, and he was taken back to London a prisoner. The people hated him, and they shouted, Traitor! Traitor! Death to the traitor! as he was led through the streets, till in fear and shame he hid his face from them as he entered the tower, out of which he never again came. Mary was so glad and happy to have won the crown, that she was at first kind to every one. She would not put Lady Jane and her husband to death, an innocent girl was not to blame, she said, but she kept them both prisoners in the tower. It is even thought that Mary would have spared the life of Northumberland, but many of the nobles hated him. It was decided that he must die, and his head was cut off. The new queen's gentleness did not last long. When once she felt herself secure upon the throne, she proved to be as self-willed as her father Henry the Eighth had been. Mary was a Roman Catholic, and she made up her mind to bring England back to that faith. At first, many of the people were glad of this, for although they did not wish to come under the rule of the Pope again, they did not like the new religion. But when Mary let it be known that she meant to marry Philip of Spain, the people were very angry. Spain was a Roman Catholic country. The English hated the Spaniards, and were afraid of them. The Spaniards they knew were cruel. They had in their country a terrible court, called the Inquisition. Inquisition means to seek out... If any one was suspected of thinking for himself in matters of religion, he was brought before this court and asked searching questions, so that the truth might be sought out. Sometimes the questions were so difficult to answer that innocent people made themselves appear guilty, but whether innocent or guilty, those who were brought before this court were nearly always tortured and often condemned to be burned to death. However much the English wished to return to the Roman Catholic religion, they did not wish this terrible inquisition to be brought into their country. They tried to make Mary marry an Englishman, but Mary was very proud and haughty. There is no Englishman my equal. I will not marry a subject, she said. No one was pleased with this marriage, and the Protestants were very much afraid. Anything they thought would be better than to allow a Spaniard to rule in England. So a plot was formed to put Mary from the throne, and to set either her sister Elizabeth or Lady Jane Grey in her place. But the plot failed. All the leaders were beheaded, and hundreds of their followers were hanged. Gentle Lady Jane, who had never wished to rule, was blamed for this rebellion. She was brought out of the tower, where she had been kept prisoner, and her beautiful head was cut off. Her husband, father, and brother were also put to death. The Queen had begun to earn for herself her terrible name of Bloody Mary. End of chapter 66「Our Island Story – Chapter 67 – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 67. Mary I. How the Princess Elizabeth became a prisoner. Queen Mary thought that her sister, the Princess Elizabeth, had a part in the plot to put her from the throne, 
So, as soon as it began, she sent some gentlemen with soldiers to take her prisoner. These gentlemen arrived late in the evening at the house where the princess was living. "'Tell the princess,' they said to her lady-in-waiting who met them, "'that we must see her at once. We come from court with a message from the queen.' The princess was ill and in bed, but the lady took the message to her. "'Go back to the gentlemen,' said the princess. "'Say to them that I welcome them, but as it is so late, I trust that they will wait to speak with me until the morning.' "'No, we must see the princess at once,' replied the gentlemen when they received this answer. And, without waiting for more, they followed the lady into Princess Elizabeth's bedroom. She was very much surprised, and angry too, when she saw them. "'Is there so much haste that you cannot wait until morning?' she asked. "'We are sorry to see you so ill,' replied the gentlemen, somewhat ashamed of themselves." "'And I am not glad to see you here at this time of night,' returned the princess. "'There is no help for it,' said the gentleman. "'We are sent by the queen, and her message is that you must come to her at once.' "'Certainly I shall be very pleased to obey,' replied Elizabeth. "'But you can see for yourselves that I am not well enough to come at present.' "'We are very sorry,' replied the gentleman. "'But you must come.' Our orders are to bring you dead or alive. This made the princess very sad, for she now felt sure that she had reason to be afraid of her sister the queen. She tried very hard to make the gentlemen go away, but they would not. At last, after a great deal of talking, she agreed to go with them next morning. When the time came, Princess Elizabeth was so ill that she fainted several times as she was being led out of the house. All her servants, crying bitterly, gathered to say good-bye to her. They loved their mistress very much, and they did not know what was going to happen. When Elizabeth arrived at court she was not allowed to see the queen, but was shut up in her room, and kept a prisoner there for a fortnight. Gentlemen of the court came and talked to her, trying to make her confess that she had helped in the rebellion against the queen. But she said always that she knew nothing of it, and had ever been true to her sister. Then one day they told her that she was to be taken to the tower. The princess became very much afraid. She knew what a dreadful place the tower was, what fearful things happened there, and how few people who once went in ever came out alive. She begged and prayed not to be taken there. "'I am true to the queen,' she said, "'in thought, word, and deed.' It is not right that she should shut me up in that sad place. But the lords replied, There is no help for it. The queen commands, and you must obey. So a boat was brought, and the princess was rowed down the Thames to the tower. It was a dreary morning. Sky and river were grey, and the rain fell fast. As the boat went slowly on, the princess sat silent and sorrowful, deep in thought. At last the boat stopped. The lords stepped out, and the princess, awakened from her sad thoughts, looked up. But when she saw that the boat had stopped at the gate of the tower called the Traitor's Gate, she sat still. "'Lady, will you land?' said one of the lords. "'No,' answered Elizabeth. "'I am no traitor.' "'Lady, it is raining,' said another of the lords, as he tried to put his cloak round her to shelter her. "'but the princess dashed it back with her hand. "'Then, rising, she stepped on shore, saying as she did so, "'Here landeth, being a prisoner, "'as true a subject as ever stood upon these steps.' "'When the princess reached the courtyard, "'she would go no farther, but sat there upon a stone. "'Not all the entreaties of the lords could move her. "'Through the cold and wet of the dreary morning "'she sat in that grim courtyard.' "'Lady, you will do well to come in out of the rain,' said the governor of the tower. "'You are but uncomfortable there.' "'Better to sit here than in a worse place,' replied the princess, "'for I know not where you will lead me.' Then one of her own servants, kneeling beside her, burst into tears. "'Why do you weep for me?' said Elizabeth. 
"'You should rather comfort me, and not weep.' "'But she rose and went sadly into the tower. "'Then the doors were locked and barred. "'The princess was a prisoner at last. "'A close prisoner Elizabeth was kept. "'Very few of her own servants were allowed to be with her. "'But one of the servants of the tower had a little son about four years old. "'He used to come to see the princess, and bring her flowers, "'and they soon became great friends.' But when Elizabeth's enemies heard of this, they thought that she would try to send messages to her friends by this little boy. So one day they caught him, and promised to give him apples and figs, if he would tell them what the princess said to him, and what messages she sent to her friends. But although the boy was so young, he understood that these men must be the enemies of the princess, and he would not tell them anything, if indeed he had anything to tell. They talked for a long time, but could learn nothing from him. "'Please, my lord,' said the little boy at last, "'will you now give me the apples and figs you promised?' "'No, indeed,' replied the gentleman, "'but you shall have a whipping if you talk to the princess any more.' "'I shall bring my lady more flowers,' replied the little boy boldly. But his father was told that he must not allow his son to run about the tower any longer, and next day the princess missed her little friend. But presently she saw him peeping through a hole in the door, and when he saw that no one was near he called to her. "'Lady, I can bring you no more flowers.' Then the princess smiled sadly, but said nothing. She knew that unkind people had taken even this one little friend from her. The princess lived in constant fear for her life. After a time she was removed from the tower, and was sent from prison to prison. It was no wonder that one day, hearing a milkmaid singing gaily, Elizabeth said she too would rather be a milkmaid and free than a great princess and a prisoner. At last she was allowed to go to Hatfield, a house near St. Albans, which now belongs to the Marquis of Salisbury. There, carefully watched and guarded, she lived until Mary died. End of chapter 67 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On July 27, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story Chapter 68 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 68. Mary I. How a Candle Was Lit in England Which Has Never Been Put Out. When Mary had put down the rebellion, which her desire to marry Philip had raised, she had her own way and married him. He came from Spain with much pomp and splendour, and as he rode through the streets of London there was a show of rejoicing, but the people did not really like him. He brought a great deal of money with him, and gave presents to the people, but still they did not like him. Parliament took good care that he should have no share in the government, and that made him angry. No one loved him except Mary. With Philip's help, the Queen began to do what she dearly wished. That was to bring England again under the power of the Pope. The Pope sent a messenger to England, and Philip and Mary, holding a solemn service, knelt at his feet. They confessed that Henry the Eighth had done a wicked thing when he quarrelled with the Pope. They said that the people of England were sorry for it, and humbly begged to be forgiven. Then the Pope's messenger granted them forgiveness in his master's name, and England was once more said to be Roman Catholic. Now began the most terrible time of Mary's reign, for it required more than a few words from King, Queen, and Pope to make England again truly Roman Catholic. The Protestants would not give up their religion. Mary was determined that they should. Those who refused were imprisoned and put to death in the most cruel way. They were burned alive. It would make you too sad to tell stories of this terrible time. In three years, nearly three hundred people were put to death by Mary's cruel orders. 
yet she did no good, but rather harm to her cause, for many who were at first on her side turned away with horror from her dreadful cruelties. These men and women who suffered death so cheerfully for their religion fought for British freedom as much as Caractacus or Harold or any of the brave men of whom you have heard, and it was much harder to die as they did than to fall in battle fighting for their country with sword and spear. So when you hear such names as Rogers, Hooper, Ridley, Latimer and Cranmer, Honour them as heroes, and think gratefully of the many, many others whose names we shall never know, but who suffered as bravely. Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man, said Latimer, as they were being led to be burned together. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. By this he meant that others hearing of the brave manner in which they died, would take heart too, and fight as bravely for their faith and freedom. So instead of crushing out God's light and truth, Mary was making it shine as a light which every one might see. Mary was not happy. She could not help knowing that her cruel behaviour did harm rather than good to the religion which she loved. Yet she went on killing and torturing more fiercely than ever. Philip grew tired of England, where he was not allowed to rule, so he went back to his own country. This was a great sorrow to Mary, for she loved her husband. Philip returned, indeed once, but it was only to get money for a war with France. Very unwillingly, the Parliament granted the money, and help he asked. But the war ended sadly for Mary. Calais, which had belonged to the English for more than two hundred years, was lost. Mary grieved very much over this. When I am dead, she said, you will find Calais graven on my heart. In the same year, 1558 AD, she died, wretched and unloved. She was succeeded by her sister, the Princess Elizabeth, who was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, the second wife of Henry the Eighth. End of chapter 68 Our Island Story Chapter 69 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by Henrietta Elizabeth Marshall. Chapter 69 Elizabeth. HOW THE IMPRISONED PRINCESS BECAME A QUEEN Then our streets were unpaved, our houses were thatched, sir, our windows were latticed, our doors only latched, sir. Yet so few were the rogues that would plunder or rob, sir, that the hangman was starved for want of a job, sir. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Then our ladies, with large ruffs tied under their neck fast, would gobble up a pound of beefsteaks for their breakfast. With a close quilled-up quaff their noddles just did fit, and were trussed up as tight as a rabbit on a spit. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Then jerkin and doublet, and yellow worsted hose, with a large pair of whiskers, was the dress of our bows. Strong beer they preferred to clarets and to hawks. No poultry they prized like the wing of an ox. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Good neighbourhood, too, there was plenty as beef, and the poor from the rich never wanted relief. While merry went the mill-clack, the shuttle and the plough, and honest men could live by the sweat of their brow. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! Then all great men were good, and all good men were great, and the props of the nation were the pillars of the state. For the sovereign and the subject one interest supported, and our powerful alliance was by all other nations courted. Oh, the golden days of good Queen Bess! In the grounds of Hatfield the oak may still be seen under which Elizabeth was sitting when messengers came to tell her that Mary was dead, and that she was queen. 
The princess listened, looking up through the bare branches to the dull November sky, then, falling upon her knees, she exclaimed in Latin words, "'It is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes.' Afterwards Elizabeth put these words upon the gold coins which were used during her reign. Upon the silver coins she put another Latin sentence, which means, "'I have chosen God for my helper.' As soon as Elizabeth knew that she was chosen to be queen, she left Hatfield, and went in state to the Tower of London, for at that time the tower was used as a royal palace as well as a prison. But this time she did not go as a prisoner. This time she did not enter by the traitor's gate. She went as a queen, free and happy, guarded indeed, but guarded with love and honour. As the queen passed through the gates she paused. Some, she said, have fallen from being princes in this land to be prisoners in this place. I am raised from being prisoner in this place to be prince in this land. That was the work of God's justice, this a work of His mercy. So must I be myself to God thankful, and to man merciful. There were great rejoicings when Elizabeth was crowned. Bonfires blazed and joy-bells rang. Yet the land and the people were in a sad and miserable state, and it needed all Elizabeth's wisdom and the wisdom of the great men who surrounded her to bring back happiness and peace to the country. Elizabeth began her reign at a very difficult time. The quarrels between the old and new religions and the cruelties of Mary had divided the people into two parties. Each party hoped that the new queen would favour them. But Elizabeth did not mean to make any of her subjects suffer death because of what they felt it right to believe. During her reign people were neither tortured nor killed in the name of religion. Elizabeth was clever, but she liked to think that she was beautiful too. She loved fine clothes, and she dressed in the most splendid silks and satins and jewels. Her courtiers told her that she was the most beautiful lady on earth. This was not true. Elizabeth was not really very beautiful, but she was vain, and liked to hear people say that she was lovely. And her people loved her so much that, very likely, they really thought that she was beautiful. Whenever it was known that the Queen would pass through the streets, the people would gather to see her. They would stand for hours waiting until she came. When she at last appeared, they would wave their hats and shout, "'God save your Majesty! God save your Majesty!' Then the Queen would stop, and, looking round on them, would say, "'God bless you all, my good people!' The people would again cry, "'God save your Majesty!' And the Queen would smile and reply, "'You may well have a greater prince, but you will never have a more loving prince.' Then, when she had gone again, the people would go to their homes, talking of what a splendid Queen she was, and of how they would die for good Queen Bess." as they loved to call her. End of chapter 69 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On July 27, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story Chapter 70 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story, Chapter 70, by H. E. Marshall. Elizabeth, the Story of a Most Unhappy Queen. At this time in Scotland, as in England, there ruled a queen, these two queens were cousins, for Margaret, the sister of Henry the Eighth, had married James the Fourth, King of Scotland, and this Mary, who was now Queen of Scotland, was their granddaughter, and Elizabeth's cousin. In spite of the fact that an English princess had married a Scottish king, the two peoples continued to be enemies, as they always had been, and Elizabeth of England did not love her cousin Mary of Scotland. She hated and feared her. Mary had been brought up in France, which is a Roman Catholic country, and she had married the French king, 
so she was Queen of France and Scotland. When Mary of England died, Mary of Scotland thought that she had a better right to the throne of England than Elizabeth. So she called herself Queen of Scotland, France, England, and Ireland. Many people agreed with Mary, among them the Pope, who was angry with Elizabeth, because she would not be ruled by him, and would no longer punish the Protestants, as her sister had done. So it was little wonder that Elizabeth hated and feared her cousin. The Protestants of England hated Mary of Scotland too. They were afraid that if she became Queen of England, she would bring back the dreadful days of the English Mary. When Mary was only nineteen, her husband, the French king, died, and she left France, where she had been living, and returned to Scotland. As she sat upon the deck of the ship, which took her to Scotland, she wept bitterly. Adieu, France, adieu, she sobbed. I shall never see you more. Scotland seemed cold and dark to Mary, after sunny France, and the people harsh and rough. Yet the Scots loved their queen, and were eager to show her that they did so. And Mary wanted to be loved, but Mary and her people did not understand each other. Although she was clever and beautiful, she was perhaps the most unhappy and most unwise queen who ever sat upon a throne. In Scotland, as in England, many dreadful things happened, because of the Reformation and change of religion. Mary was a Roman Catholic, while many of her people had turned to the new religion. There were other causes for quarrels, so there was sorrow and war, until at last the Scottish people imprisoned their beautiful queen in a lonely castle, upon an island in the middle of a loch. But although many people hated Mary, many loved her too, and these helped her to escape. One evening a boy called the Little Douglas, who lived in the castle where she was imprisoned, stole the keys while the governor was at supper. In the middle of the night he unlocked the door of Mary's room. Fearfully and silently she crept with him through the dark passages till they reached the great gate. Douglas unlocked it, and Mary passed out, holding her little frightened maid by the hand. Douglas locked the gate behind them, and led the way to the place where a boat was waiting for them. They were soon out on the dark water, getting farther and farther away from the castle. Halfway to the shore, little Douglas leaned over the side of the boat, and dropped the great castle keys into the water. Mary's jailers were prisoners in the castle, and she was free. On land, some of Queen Mary's friends were waiting for her, with horses, and she rode joyfully away. Soon more friends joined her, and a battle was fought near Glasgow, but Mary's soldiers were defeated, and she was obliged to flee. She did not know where to go. It would have been safest to go to France, but no ship was ready to take her there. So she crossed the border into England, and went to ask her cousin Elizabeth to take pity on her. Elizabeth had never seen her beautiful cousin, and she refused to see her now. She gave her a castle to live in, not as a royal guest, but as a prisoner. Mary had had to run away from Scotland so quickly that she had brought no clothes except those she wore. She wrote to tell Elizabeth this, but although Elizabeth had hundreds of beautiful dresses, she only sent some old clothes quite unfit for a queen to wear. Poor Mary would have been badly off, but her enemies were kinder than her cousin, and sent her dresses and clothes from Scotland. When Queen Mary found that Elizabeth meant to treat her as a prisoner, and not as a friend, she begged to be allowed to go away to some other country, but Elizabeth would not set her free. She feared if she did, Mary would go to the kings of France or Spain, and ask them to make war on England. She felt that it was safest to keep her great enemy in prison. Mary was so beautiful that she had many friends, and they were very angry with Elizabeth. Plot after plot to free Mary was formed, but all plots failed. For nineteen years this poor queen was kept in prison. She was moved from castle to castle, for it seemed as if no place was strong and safe enough to keep her from her friends. At last she was shut up in a castle called Fotheringay. When Mary had been kept in prison about nineteen years, 
a plot to kill Elizabeth and put Mary on the throne, was discovered. Then the English Parliament persuaded Elizabeth that Mary must be put to death. Elizabeth either really felt, or pretended to feel, very unwilling to give her consent, but in the end she signed a paper, ordering Mary's head to be cut off. A few days later, the beautiful Queen, who had been so unhappy, and who had caused so much unhappiness, walked into the great hall at Fotheringay. In one hand she carried a Bible, and the other a crucifix. The hall was hung with black. At one end was a low scaffold, also covered with black. Nineteen years before, Mary had come to England, young and beautiful, and although she was not yet old, the long years in prison had made her look like an old woman. She could only walk with difficulty, and when she laid her head upon the block, it was seen that her hair was white. Mary's servants cried bitterly when she said good-bye to them, although she comforted them by saying that to her death was a happy release out of prison. Her little dog would not leave her, even after she was dead, but crept close to her dress, whining sadly, as the Dean of Peterborough cried, So perish all Elizabeth's enemies. When Elizabeth was told that Mary was dead, she was very angry. She said that although she had signed the death warrant, as the paper was called, she had not meant that Mary should be killed. It is difficult to know what Elizabeth did mean, for she was deceitful as well as clever. But whether she meant it or not, Elizabeth had no right to behead Mary. Mary's son James, who was now the King of Scotland, was very angry with Elizabeth for the manner in which she had treated his mother. But he had neither money nor soldiers enough with which to fight against England, so he did nothing. End of chapter 70 Our Island Story, Chapter 71 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 71 Elizabeth. The Story of How England Was Saved from the Spaniards. Philip, king of Spain, who had been married to Mary I, wanted after her death to marry her sister Elizabeth, who was now Queen of England. But Elizabeth would not marry him, and that made him very angry. Philip hated the English people and the Protestant religion, and he made up his mind to conquer England and punish Elizabeth. He gathered together a great number of soldiers and sailors and guns and ships, and made ready to invade England. Among the many famous Englishmen of this time was a man called Drake. He had sailed in far-off seas to newly discovered countries, and was very bold and daring. While Philip was busy making ready to invade England, Drake sailed over to Spain, and boldly entered the harbour where the Spanish vessels lay. He sank and burned thirty or more of them, damaged others, and then sailed away again. This, he said with a laugh, was just singeing the king of Spain's beard. King Philip was very angry, but he at once set to work to repair his ships, and to build others, and next year was ready to attack England. In May 1588 A.D., one hundred and twenty-nine great ships sailed out from Spain, but, hindered by a storm, it was many weeks later before they came in sight of the English coast. These Spanish ships, with their gilded prows and white sails shining in the sun, made a splendid show as they sailed along in the shape of a crescent seven miles long. King Philip called his fleet the Invincible Armada. Invincible means, which cannot be conquered. Armada is a Spanish word meaning navy. Once again, as in the days of the Romans, and as in the days of the Danes, the little green island in the lonely sea was threatened with conquerors, coming in great ships. The people of England had been slow to believe that there was any danger from Spain, and the Queen was unwilling to make preparations. But when at last they saw that the Spaniards meant to come, the country rose like one man. 
Roman Catholics and Protestants forgot their quarrels, and, remembering only that they were Englishmen, worked together against the common enemy. The English navy at this time was very small, but gentlemen and merchants gave money and ships, and soon it was almost as large as the Spanish navy, although the ships were smaller. Besides these ships and sailors, a great army gathered on land in order to resist Philip, should he succeed in reaching England, in spite of the wooden walls, as the English war-vessels came to be called. Men young and old flocked to the standard. Very few were real soldiers, but all of them were eager to fight for their queen and for their country. Elizabeth herself reviewed the army, and spoke such brave words, that the hopes of the men who heard her rose high. "'I am come among you,' she said, "'not for pleasure nor to amuse myself. I am come to live or die with you in battle, to lay down my honour and my life, for my God, for my country, and for my people. I know that I have but the body of a poor weak woman, but I have the heart of a king, and of an English king. I think foul scorn that any Spanish prince, or any prince in Europe, should dare to invade my kingdom. Rather than be so dishonoured, I myself will take up arms. Myself will be your general, and the judge and rewarder of every one of you for your deeds in the field of battle. So eagerly did the people work, that England was ready before Spain, and Lord Howard, the chief admiral, sailed out to meet the enemy. But week after week passed, and as still the Spaniards did not come, he returned to Plymouth with his ships. Elizabeth was not fond of spending money. She thought that it was a dreadful waste to keep all these soldiers and sailors and ships waiting for an enemy who never came, and she told Lord Howard to pay off his men and send them to their homes. But Lord Howard refused to obey, and he with his captains and his men held their ships in readiness at Plymouth. Day by day they kept watch, looking always anxiously out to sea, and spending the long weary hours as best they could. At last, one sunny day in July, when Drake and some of the other sea captains were playing at bowls, they were interrupted by a cry, "'The Spaniards! The Spaniards!' The game was stopped. All eyes were turned towards the channel. Yes, there at last, far out to sea, the proud Spanish vessels were to be seen. They were distant yet, but a sailor's eye could see that they were mighty and great ships, and the number of them was very large. But the brave English captains were not afraid. "'Come,' said Drake, after a few minutes, "'there is time to finish the game, and to beat the Spaniards, too.' So they went back to their play, and when the game was finished they went down to the harbour, got the ships ready, and sailed out to meet and fight the Spaniards. For more than a week the battle lasted, the English always having the best of it. Their ships were smaller, but for that very reason they could be moved, and turned about more easily than the great painted and gilded Spanish vessels. The wind, too, was in favour of the English, and against the Spaniards. In those days, before steam-engines and steamers had been invented, when ships were still moved by sails, the wind was of great importance. Day by day the wind grew fiercer, the waves became white and wild, till the Spanish ships were driven northward by a terrible storm. Without pilots, through unknown seas, past strange islands they were driven. Shattered on unfriendly rocks, refused the shelter of every port, up to the north of Scotland and back round the west coast of Ireland they sped. At last, ruined by shot and shell, torn and battered by wind and waves, about fifty maimed and broken wrecks, all that were left of the invincible armada, reached Spain. Once again England was saved. How the people rejoiced! Bells rang, bonfires blazed, and every heart was filled with thankfulness. In memory of the victory the Queen ordered a medal to be made, and on it, in Latin, were the words, God blew with his breath, and they were scattered. Although Philip had lost nearly all his ships, he did not consider that he was beaten, and the war went on until the death of Elizabeth. 
but the English people no longer feared the Spaniards. End of chapter 71. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On July 27, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Our Island Story, Chapter 72. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 72. Elizabeth, the Story of Sir Walter Raleigh. The reign of Queen Elizabeth was great, not only because she was a wise ruler, but because she was surrounded by so many wise and great and good men. One of these wise men, Sir William Cecil, afterwards called Lord Burley, was her secretary of state, and her chief adviser during nearly all her reign, until he died in 1598 A.D. There were so many great men in England at this time, that you could not remember all their names, and to tell stories about them all, would fill a whole book. In the reign of Elizabeth, it is not only the men who were soldiers that we remember as great, but the men who wrote books, the men who sailed over the sea and discovered new countries, and the men who by careful thinking and wise acts kept peace at home. Sir Walter Raleigh was one of the great men who lived at this time. He was a soldier and a sailor, a courtier, and a writer of books. But clever though he was, until the great queen noticed him, he remained only a simple country gentleman. One day, Elizabeth was passing along the streets, and the people as usual came crowding to see her. Among them was Sir Walter Raleigh. The queen stepped from her coach, and followed by her ladies, was about to cross the road. But in those days, the streets were very badly kept and Elizabeth stopped before a puddle of mud. She was grandly dressed, and how to cross the muddy road without soiling her dainty shoes and skirts she did not know. As she paused, Sir Walter sprang forward. He too was finely dressed, and he was wearing a beautiful new cloak. This he quickly pulled off, and bowing low, threw upon the ground before the Queen. Elizabeth was very pleased, and as she passed on, she smiled at the handsome young man who had ruined his beautiful cloak to save her dainty shoes, and ordered him to attend her at court. Raleigh's fortune was made. He went to court and soon became so great a favourite that at one time he even thought that he might marry the queen. Fain would I climb, but that I fear to fall, he one day wrote with a diamond upon a window, and the queen, seeing it, wrote underneath, If thy heart fail thee, climb then not at all. So Raleigh climbed, and although he never reached a throne, he climbed high. Elizabeth gave him money and lands, till he became very rich. He wanted to sail away over the sea in search of new countries and treasure, as Drake had done, but the queen would not let him go. As Raleigh could not go himself, he spent a great deal of his money in buying ships and sending other men over the sea to find new lands. These men sailed to America, which was then wild and unknown. Landing there, they claimed it for England, and Raleigh named it Virginia of Elizabeth. She liked to call herself the Virgin Queen, which means the queen who has never married. One of the United States of America is still called Virginia. For a long time Elizabeth was very pleased with Raleigh, but at last she became angry with him and sent him to prison in the dreadful tower. The reason for this was that Sir Walter had dared to love and marry another lady, one of the Queen's own maids of honour. Elizabeth was always very angry if any of the gentlemen in her court married. Many of them wished to marry her, but she refused them all. Still, she wished them to think that she was the cleverest and most beautiful woman in all the world. She wished them all to love and admire her, 
so much that they would never think of marrying any other lady, and when they did marry another she was always very angry. Sir Walter, happily, was not kept in prison very long, and some years later he really did have his wish, and sailed away to explore America. He did not find the golden land which he had imagined, but he brought home many strange stories, and many curious and useful things. Two of the things which Raleigh brought home with him were tobacco and potatoes. Elizabeth had given him estates in Ireland, and there he planted the potatoes, and showed the people how to grow them. Even to this day, the poor people in Ireland grow many potatoes, and live on them very largely. People were pleased with the new vegetable, but they were very much astonished when he showed them how to use tobacco. Such a thing had never been seen before, and it took people some time to grow accustomed to it. One day, soon after Raleigh had returned home, he was sitting smoking, when a servant came into the room. The man stood still in horror. Smoke filled the room and was pouring out of his master's mouth. He must be on fire, thought the servant. Without saying a word, he ran away and returned as quickly as he could with a pail of water. This he threw over his master, hoping to put out the fire and so save his life. Raleigh, you may imagine, was not very pleased at finding himself suddenly drenched with cold water, just when he was enjoying a quiet smoke. But, when he understood the mistake his servant had made, he laughed heartily. Raleigh had many adventures. He swept the ocean in his ships, and he fought by land and sea. But he wrote books, too, and one of his friends was the poet Spencer, who tells the beautiful stories in his poem, The Fairy Queen. The greatest writer of this time, perhaps the greatest poet of any time, was Shakespeare. His name you know, and some day you will read the stories he wrote. Another writer, and great soldier too, was Sir Philip Sidney. He was so handsome and brave and kind that everyone loved him. Queens, statesmen and people, soldiers, courtiers and poets, all loved him. He lived well, wrote well, fought well, and died well. He fell fighting for his country. Wounded and groaning with pain, he asked for a cup of water. While it was being brought, he noticed a soldier lying beside him in great agony. Give it to him, he said, pointing to this poor soldier. The man refused to have it. Nay, but take it, said Sir Philip. You need it more than I do. Sir Philip never recovered from his wound. A fortnight later he died, still young, brave, and handsome. End of Part 72 Our Island Story, Chapter 73 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 73. Elizabeth. The Story of the Queen's Favorite. Another brave and handsome man, who was a great favorite with the Queen, was the Earl of Essex. He was so handsome and graceful that the Queen liked to have him always near her, although she quarreled with him very often. Essex loved fighting more than attending upon the Queen, and twice when there was war he ran away without leave. Elizabeth was angry, but Essex did great deeds, and helped to make the name of England famous, so she forgave him. Later she made him commander of an expedition which, however, was not very successful. Again they quarrelled. One day the Queen and her counsellors were talking about who should govern Ireland. Elizabeth wanted one man, Essex another. He grew so angry because she would not take his advice that he turned his back upon her. This was a very rude thing to do, for one must never turn one's back to a king or queen, but must even walk out of the room backwards when leaving their presence. Elizabeth was furious, and, springing up, she boxed the earl's ears. Essex had been angry before. Now he was in a terrible rage. Forgetting that a man must never fight with a woman, he laid his hand upon his sword. Then a gentleman who was there threw himself between the angry queen and earl, trying to calm them both. 
but Essex would not be calmed. "'I will take a blow from no one,' he cried. "'I would not have endured it from her father, King Henry. I will not take it from a king in petticoats.' And, swearing dreadfully, he flung himself out of the room, refusing to return. For some time the advisers of the Queen, and the friends of the Earl, tried to make peace between them, but in vain. Essex would not apologize, the Queen would not say that she was sorry. But in the end the Queen forgave Essex, and he came back to court. As they had quarrelled over who should be sent to govern Ireland, Elizabeth decided to send Essex himself. This was not at all what Essex wanted. It was a very difficult post, and he did not wish to accept it, but he was obliged to do so. He went to Ireland, but he did not succeed in ruling as the Queen would have liked. She wrote bitter, angry letters to him, and he replied with letters as bitter and angry as hers. At last Essex decided to come back to England to see the Queen, and try to make friends with her again. Elizabeth forbade him, but in spite of her orders he came. Early one morning he arrived in London, dusty, dirty, and untidy from his long journey. He was in such haste to see the Queen that he did not stop to make himself fit to appear at court. Dusty and untidy as he was, he rushed straight to the palace. It was so early that the Queen was not up. Hearing that, Essex ran to her room, without even waiting till some one had told her that he had arrived. The Queen was sitting in her room, with her hair hanging down, waiting for her ladies to dress her, when Essex rushed in, and, flinging himself on his knees beside her, kissed her hand again and again. The Queen was so surprised to see Essex, and so sorry when she saw how miserable he looked, that she spoke gently to him, and comforted him. So presently he rose from his knees, and went away feeling that he was forgiven. But it was only surprise which had made the Queen kind to Essex. Later in the day she received him very coldly. Later still she sent him to prison. For some time Essex was kept a prisoner, then he was set free, but he could not again win the Queen's favour. Her unkindness hurt him so much that he grew more and more unhappy, and more and more angry. He began to say unkind things about the Queen, calling her a foolish old woman, who was growing crooked in mind and body. It was quite true that Elizabeth was growing old, and, being as vain as ever, she liked to think that she was still young and pretty. She covered her grey hair with a wig, and painted her face. She sang and danced, although she was nearly seventy years old. But it was wrong and foolish of Essex to speak as he did, and people were not slow to carry his words to the Queen. At last Essex grew so angry that he tried to raise a rebellion against Elizabeth. The rebellion failed, and Essex and those who had helped him were sent to the tower. In spite of all their quarrels, Elizabeth really loved Essex. Now she felt it very hard to condemn him to death. Still, she did. Long before this, Elizabeth had one day given Essex a ring, telling him that if ever she should be angry with him, she would forgive him if he sent this ring back to her. When Essex heard that he was to die, he remembered this promise, and he made up his mind to send the ring to Elizabeth, hoping that she would pardon him. But he did not know how to send it. He was afraid to give it to any of the Queen's courtiers, for he knew that many of them were his enemies. They were only too glad that he should be in disgrace, and would never deliver the ring to the Queen. At length, one day, as he looked sadly from his prison window, he saw a boy passing— the boy had a pleasant, honest face, and Essex felt sure that he might be trusted. He called to him, and, throwing the ring down, told him to take it to his cousin, who was a kind lady and loved him. "'Tell the lady,' he said, "'to show this ring to the Queen, and all will be well.' The boy took the ring, promising to do as he was asked. Then Essex threw down a purse full of gold, as a reward for his kindness— and the boy went away very pleased. 
but by mistake he gave the ring to the wrong lady. Instead of giving it to the cousin of Essex, who loved him, he gave it to another lady who hated him. This lady showed the ring to her husband, and, as he too hated Essex, they resolved to keep the ring, and say nothing about it. So Elizabeth never knew that Essex had sent it. She too had remembered her promise, and hoped that Essex would send the ring. She waited and waited, but day after day went past, and it never came. At last, thinking that he was too proud to ask forgiveness, she ordered his head to be cut off. So proud and foolish Essex died, believing his queen was still angry with him. Elizabeth was growing old. Many of her friends had died and left her, and after the death of Essex she was often very sad. The people, too, who had loved Essex, were angry with her for having put him to death, and that made her more sad still. When the lady who had kept back the ring was about to die, she felt very sorry for what she had done. She could not find peace until she had confessed to the queen, and asked her forgiveness. She sent a message to the queen, begging her to come to her. Elizabeth came, but when she heard the story, instead of forgiving the poor dying lady, she shook her fiercely, saying, "'God may forgive you. I never can.' At last Elizabeth herself grew very ill, but she would not go to bed. She sat day and night upon cushions on the floor, doing nothing but staring before her, with her finger in her mouth. Then Sir Robert Cecil, the son of the great Lord Burley, who had been so wise and faithful a friend to Elizabeth, said, "'For the sake of your people, madam, you must go to bed.' "'Must!' exclaimed the Queen. "'Must is not a word to use to princes. "'Little man, little man, your father would not have dared to use that word. "'But you know I must die, and that makes you so bold.' "'At last she allowed herself to be carried to bed. "'Some of her lords, knowing that she had not long to live, "'asked whom she wished to reign after her. "'I will have no rascal's son in my seat,' she said, "'and would say no more.' Later they asked again, "'Do you desire your cousin, the King of Scotland, to have the crown?' The Queen only moved her head, but it seemed to those around that she meant to say, "'Yes. She never spoke again. On March 24, 1603 A.D., this great Queen died, having reigned forty-five years. She had loved her country, and her people, and her people loved her, and wept for her at her death. No ruler had ever before been so mourned. She was the last of the Tudor sovereigns, and with her successor, James, a new race of kings, called the Stuarts, began to reign in England. End of chapter 73 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org in Montreal, Canada, visiting Hugh McGuire on um, August 19th, 2006. Our Island Story Chapter 74 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 74 James the Sixth of Scotland Of England The Story of Guy Fawkes For hundreds of years the kings of England had tried to conquer Scotland, and make Scotland and England one kingdom under one king. Many dreadful battles had been fought. Many brave people had been killed. The Scots had lost many battles, but they had never been conquered, and at last the kings of England had almost given up hope of ever being able to conquer them. But now, what they had longed for, and fought for in vain, happened quite quietly and naturally. 
although not at all in the way that they had expected. Instead of an English king conquering and ruling over Scotland, a Scottish king came to rule over England. Elizabeth Tudor, Queen of England, being dead, James Stuart, King of Scotland, was the rightful heir to the throne. James the Sixth of Scotland was the son of the beautiful and unhappy Mary, Queen of Scots, was descended from Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry the Eighth, and was Elizabeth's nearest relative. At the Queen's death there was no man nor woman left in England who had any right to the throne. So the English sent to Scotland, and asked the Scottish king to come to be their king too. He came, and since 1603 A.D., England and Scotland have formed one kingdom with Wales and Ireland. So now we will no longer talk of England, but of Britain, for long ago the old hatred has been forgotten, and we are all Britons. James had been King of Scotland for many years before he became King of England too. He was a very little boy when he was first made King, and Scotland had been ruled by a regent. James had been carefully taught, but unfortunately his teachers had thought more of making him clever than of teaching him things which would have made him a great ruler. Some people called him the British Solomon, but because he was such a mixture of wisdom and foolishness, he has also been called the wisest fool in Christendom. Although his mother, Queen Mary, was a Roman Catholic, James had been brought up a Protestant. The English Roman Catholics thought, however, that in memory of his mother, James would be kinder to them than Elizabeth had been. Elizabeth had not burned and tortured the Roman Catholics as her sister Mary had burned and tortured the Protestants. Still, they were not quite kindly treated. They had not equal rights with the Protestants, and were sometimes looked down upon. The Roman Catholics soon found out that James had no intention of being kind to them, and they became very angry. So angry did they become that they formed a plot to kill the king, and all the chief Protestants in the country. Having done this, they intended to place James's little daughter, Elizabeth, upon the throne, and make Britain a Roman Catholic country once more. Princess Elizabeth was, of course, being brought up as a Protestant, but she was such a little girl that the Catholics knew she would only be a make-believe queen. Until she grew up, the country would really be ruled by the Catholic gentlemen, and meantime they would have time, they thought, to teach her to be a Roman Catholic. The first thing to be done was to kill the king and all the chief Protestant gentlemen. To do this, the conspirators, as the people who form a plot are called, thought of a very dreadful plan. They decided to wait until Parliament was sitting, until the king and all his wise men were gathered together in one place, and then they would blow them up with gunpowder. Underneath the Houses of Parliament there were cellars. These cellars were let to merchants and other people who wished to store goods. It was quite easy for the conspirators to rent one of these cellars, and into it they carried thirty-six barrels of gunpowder. Besides the gunpowder, sticks and firewood were piled into the cellars by the conspirators. This was done partly to hide the barrels, and partly, no doubt, to help to burn the Houses of Parliament when they were set on fire. Nobody paid much attention to the barrels as they were being taken in, and nobody thought of asking with what they were filled. For a year and a half the plot went on. Very few people knew of it, and those who did were bound by an oath never to talk of it. They met secretly at night, speaking only in mysterious whispers. At last everything was ready. Guy Fawkes, one of the most fearless of the band, was chosen for the most difficult and dangerous part. He was to set fire to the gunpowder. Having done so, he meant to try to escape, but if he could not, he was quite ready to die in what he thought was a good cause. The day was fixed for the 5th of November, when Parliament would be opened. A man called Francis Tresham had joined the plot. He had a friend, a Roman Catholic nobleman, who was sure to be among the lords who would attend this Parliament. 
Tresham could not bear to think of his friend being killed, so he wrote a letter to him in a disguised hand, warning him not to go to this Parliament. My lord, said the letter, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care for your life. Therefore I advise you, if you love your life, to make some excuse so that you need not go to this Parliament. God and man are agreed to punish the wickedness of this time. Do not think lightly of this warning, but go away into the country where you may be safe. For although there is no sign of any stir, yet I say, they shall receive a terrible blow this Parliament, and yet they shall not see who hurts them. Tresham's friend was very much disturbed by this letter. He took it to Lord Salisbury, who took it to the king. The king, who was afterwards very proud of his cleverness, said that the terrible blow which was to be given, without the person being seen, must mean gunpowder. It was clever of the king to think of this, but some people say that Salisbury had already found out about the plot, and perhaps he put the idea of gunpowder into the king's head. About midnight on the 4th of November, the day before Parliament was to meet, the cellars under the houses were searched. With hushed voices, drawn swords and dim lanterns, the searchers moved from cellar to cellar. All seemed empty, silent and dark, till in a far corner a faint light was seen, and near it the dark figure and pale face of Guy Fawkes. In a moment they were upon him. He tried to defend himself, but it was useless. Stern men with drawn swords closed in upon him, and he was soon a prisoner. He could not deny his guilt. Round him were the barrels, in his pockets were those things which he needed to set fire to the gunpowder. He knew he must die. Oh, would I had been quicker, he said. Would I had set fire to the powder. Death would have been sweet had some of my enemies gone with me. Guy Fawkes was taken to the tower. In the cruel manner of those days, he was tortured to make him tell the names of the others who were with him in the plot. But Guy Fawkes was very brave, although he was wrong and he would not tell. The others, seeing that part of their plot had failed, hoped still to succeed in gaining possession of the Princess Elizabeth so they hastily rode to the country house where she was living. But part of the gunpowder which they took with them was set on fire and exploded by accident. It hurt some and frightened all of them, for they thought it was a punishment sent upon them because of what they had intended to do to others. The Roman Catholics in the country did not rise to help the conspirators as they had expected, and soon all hope of success was lost. The chief of the conspirators were seized, and were put to death along with Guy Fawkes. After this the Protestants hated the Roman Catholics more than ever, and their lives were made very hard. There was great rejoicing at the discovery of the plot. Bells rang and bonfires blazed, and even now, after three hundred years, the day is not forgotten. On the 5th of November people still have fireworks and bonfires, on which they burn a figure made of straw and old clothes, which is meant to represent Guy Fawkes. End of part 74 Our Island Story, Chapter 75 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall, Chapter Seventy Five. James the Sixth of Scotland, First of England, The Story of the Mayflower. When Henry the Eighth broke away from the Church of Rome, he did not make much change in the services or in the ruling of the Church. He merely said that the Pope had nothing to do with the Church in England, and he commanded the services to be read in English instead of Latin. But by degrees many Protestants began to think that the Church of England was too like the Church of Rome. They wanted to have no prayer book at all. They wanted to have very simple services, and very simple churches. 
these people were called Puritans. They were very stern and grave, but many of the best and bravest men in England joined them. At this time men did not wear plain dark clothes as they do now. They wore bright colors, and their clothes were often made of silk and velvet, and trimmed with lace. They wore their hair long and curly, and they had feathers in their hats. But the Puritans thought this gay dress was wicked. They cut their hair short, and wore dark clothes, and plain linen collars, instead of lace and feathers, and gay-colored silks and satins. They even spoke in a slow and sad tone of voice, using curious and long words, and they very seldom laughed. The Puritans felt that in England they could not worship God in what seemed to them the right way. So, although they loved their country, they resolved to leave it, and sail away over the sea to the new lands which had been discovered. There they would found a new England, where they could be free. The first of these Puritans who left England were called the Pilgrim Fathers. The ship they sailed in was called the Mayflower. There were only one hundred of them, men, women, and children. Before they started there were many sad partings. All left dear friends behind. Some said good-bye forever to fathers and mothers. Some left their wives and little children, hoping one day to be able to send for them, when they had made a new home far over the sea. But, sad as they were, their hearts were full of hope, and, in spite of tears, they sang hymns. They started in the summer, but they had so many delays and misfortunes that it was winter before they reached America. They did not come to the part of America to which they had expected to come, but reached land much further north, where the winter was very cold, far colder than the English winter. As the little Mayflower drew near, the shore of their new home looked very dark and dreary to those pilgrim fathers. There were no people to greet them on the beach, no houses with twinkling lights by night and cheerful smoke by day. There was nothing but the rough rocky shore, and beyond it a mass of bare brown trees. There was no sound but the roar of the waves, the call of sea-birds, and the cry of wild animals. The little band of pilgrims felt very lonely when they landed in this strange country, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any white people. Dark woods and wilderness lay in front, behind the cold grey sea separating them from all their loved ones, and round them, day and night, the fear of attack from the wild red Indians who inhabited the land. But in spite of dangers and hardships they did not lose heart. Soon the noise of axe and saw was heard in the forest as the pilgrim fathers felled trees and cut them into planks with which to build their houses. Through cold and wind and rain they worked, and a little town of wooden houses rose round the little wooden meeting-house, as they called their church. The building went on slowly, for all the pilgrim fathers could not work at once. Some of them had to keep watch in case of attack from the Red Indians, while the remainder built the houses and laid out the gardens. The little band struggled bravely. They were often cold and hungry, weary and afraid. Still they did not give up hope. They had very little to eat. Sometimes they did not even know at night if they would have anything for breakfast in the morning. Once an eagle was shot, and they thought it was a great treat. It tasted something like mutton. Once a sailor found a herring on the shore. As it was only enough for one, the captain had it for supper, but many of the pilgrims, unused to such hardships, died during the winter. At last the dark days passed, and with the sunshine of the spring came brighter times, and with the spring the Mayflower, which had lain in the bay all winter, sailed back to England. With sad hearts the pilgrims saw it go. It was the last link which bound them to their old home. Yet in spite of the longing in their hearts for the green fields and white cliffs of England, in spite of all the hardships they had suffered, not one pilgrim returned home with the Mayflower. They knelt upon the shore, watching with tear-dimmed eyes till the last glimmer of its white sails died away in the distance. Then they turned back to their work. But for many days after the bay seemed sad and empty, with no little Mayflower riding at anchor in it. 
the pilgrim fathers named their town plymouth after the town in england from which they had sailed from these few settlers the great american nation has grown and although america is no longer a british colony but a separate nation it is a nation which has grown out of the british nation if you look at the map of america you will see plymouth marked in the state of massachusetts in that town there is a hall called pilgrim hall and in front of it stands a rock which is railed round and carefully preserved it is the rock which the feet of the pilgrim fathers first touched when they landed to found new england the people of america are proud to remember that they are descended from those stern brave men and women so they guard the stone as something precious and the twenty-second of december the day on which the pilgrim fathers landed is called forefathers day and is kept as a holiday the breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast and the woods against the stormy sky their giant branches tossed and the heavy night hung dark the hills and water o'er when a band of exiles moored their bark on the wild new england shore not as the conqueror comes they the true-hearted came not with the roll of stirring drums and the trumpet that sings of fame not as the flying come in silence and in fear they shook the depths of the desert gloom with their hymns of lofty cheer amidst the storm they sang and the stars heard and the sea and the sounding aisles of the dim wood rang to the anthem of the free the ocean eagle soared from his nest by the white waves foam and the rocking pines of the forest roared this was their welcome home there were men with hoary hair amidst that pilgrim band why had they come to wither there away from their childhood's land there was woman's fearless eye lit by her deep love's truth there was manhood's brow serenely high and the fiery heart of youth what sought they thus afar bright jewels of the mine the wealth of seas the spoils of war no twas a faith's pure shrine yes call it holy ground which first their brave feet trod they have left unstained what there they found freedom to worship god End of chapter 75 Read by Kara Schallenberg on August 20th, 2006 Visiting Hugh McGuire in Montreal, Canada Our Island's Story Chapter 76 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 76 How a Woman Struck a Blow for Freedom Like Queen Elizabeth, King James had favourites, but unfortunately the favourites he chose were not good and wise men who helped him to govern well but men who, although clever, were bad, and who thought only of themselves. Some of these men liked money and fine clothes, and James spent so much on them that he was always poor and in debt, and this led him into quarrels with the people and Parliament. The Tudors had been a very autocratic race of kings. Autocratic is a word made from Greek words, and means that the Tudors wanted to rule quite by themselves, without help or advice from any one. During the time of the Tudors, especially in the reigns of Henry the Eighth and Elizabeth, the power of Parliament had been much lessened. James tried to lessen it still more. James knew how autocratic Elizabeth had been, and he meant to be the same. But Elizabeth, although she had her own way in many things, knew when to yield and let the people have their way. James did not know how to yield. He wanted to be a despot, which is another word taken from Greek, and really means master, but has come to mean cruel master. The king can do no wrong, said James. What he does must be right, and the people must obey 
and ask no questions. King James wrote several books, and in one of them he set down his ideas about the power of a king. But the people did not agree with these ideas. They thought many of the things which the king did were wrong. As they would not do everything he wished them to do, James dismissed Parliament, and ruled for many years without calling another. When James died in 1625 A.D., no one was very sorry. He had reigned for fifty-eight years, thirty-six years as King of Scotland, and twenty-two as King of Great Britain and Ireland, and his people, English, Scots, and Irish, were discontented with his rule. Yet in spite of all he had tried to do, the people were really nearer freedom than before, for they had shown that they would not quietly submit to the rule of a despot. James was succeeded by his son Charles. He had been taught by his father to believe that the king could do no wrong, and like his father, Charles wanted to be autocratic. Charles too dismissed Parliament, because he could not have entirely his own way. He tried to make the people pay taxes, and give him money without the consent of Parliament, and this made them very angry. Like King James, King Charles had bad advisers, and one of the worst, perhaps, was his own wife, of whom he was very fond. She was a French princess called Henrietta Maria, and was a Roman Catholic. She hated the Puritans, who were growing more and more important in England. Charles hated them too, and, with the advice of Archbishop Lord, who was one of his chief advisers, he treated the Puritans very hardly. Many of the people in Scotland had become Protestant. They were called Presbyterians, and like the Puritans, they chose to have a very simple form of worship, and very simple churches. This did not please Charles. He said that the Scottish Church must use the same service as the English Church. He ordered a new prayer book to be made, which was almost the same as the English prayer book. This he sent to all the Scottish ministers, commanding them to begin to use it on Sunday 23rd of July 1637 A.D. There was great excitement among the Scottish people when this order became known. On the Sunday morning many crowded to the Cathedral of St. Giles in Edinburgh, wondering what would happen. When the dean entered it was seen that he was wearing a white robe instead of the black one in which the Scottish clergy usually preached. The dean knew little of the anger which was rising in the hearts of the stern-faced men and women round him, as the words of the new prayers rang strangely through the silent church. He began the service using the new prayer book, but he had not gone far when an old woman called Jenny Geddes sprang up. "'Thou false thief!' she cried. "'Wilt thou say mass at my ear?' And with that she threw the stool upon which she had been sitting at the dean's head. In a moment the whole church was in confusion. "'The mass! The mass! Popery! Popery!' shouted the people. "'Down with the Pope! Down with him!' The women rushed at the dean and tore his white surplice from his shoulders. He was so hardly used that he ran the risk of being killed. The Bishop of Edinburgh went into the pulpit and tried to calm the people, but they would not listen to him. "'A Pope! A Pope!' they cried. "'Down with him! Down with him!' At last soldiers were sent for, the church was cleared, the doors were locked, and the new service was read to the few who were in favour of it. Outside the crowd yelled, and hooted, breaking the windows with stones and hammering on the doors, which were locked and barred against them. The bishop barely escaped with his life. He was carried through the crowd, surrounded by soldiers with drawn swords in their hands. All Scotland was in arms, high and low, banded together to resist the king. They drew up a paper which was signed by thousands, binding themselves to fight for the freedom of religion. The paper was called the National Covenant, and the people who signed it the Covenanters. Scotland was ready for war, and Charles was forced to recall the prayer book and allow the Scottish Church to be free. Charles promised the Scottish Church freedom, but he could never keep his word. 
Soon he raised an army, intending to force them to do as he wished. But the Scots were ready to fight, and they marched into England to meet Charles. The English Puritans were on the side of the Scots, and for the first time in all history a Scottish army coming into England was welcomed by the English. The fighting ended in a victory for the Scots, and once more Charles promised them freedom in religion. If you should ever go to St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, you will see there is a brass plate in memory of Jenny Geddes and her deed. It is set there not because it is right or wrong to use a prayer book, not because it is better to worship God in one way rather than another, but because it is right that people should be free to pray to God and worship God in their own way. Neither Pope nor King has a right to say how any man or woman shall pray, and it is not because Jenny Geddes fought against a prayer book, but because she struck a blow for freedom that we remember her. End of chapter 76 Our Island Story, chapter 77 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 77. Charles I. The story of how the King and the Parliament quarrelled, and at last fought. As Parliament would not do exactly as King Charles wished, he ruled without one for nearly twelve years. During these years he was often in need of money, and raised it in many wrong ways. But at last he could get no more money by right or by wrong ways, and he was obliged to call a Parliament. In 1640 A.D. what is known as the Long Parliament began to sit. It was called the Long Parliament because it lasted so long. The people chose the members for this Parliament very carefully, and they were not slow to show the King how strong they were. They beheaded one of the King's advisers because they said he had been guilty of treason. To commit treason means to do anything that is hurtful to the state or government. To commit high treason is to do anything hurtful to the King. The Parliament also imprisoned Archbishop Laud, and three years later he was beheaded. King Charles had quarrelled with every Parliament he had had during his reign. Now the quarrels grew worse and worse. At last, one day, Charles marched to the House, followed by his soldiers, meaning to seize five members who, he thought, were his worst enemies. Leaving his soldiers at the door of the house, Charles went in, and marched up to the Speaker's chair. "'Mr. Speaker,' he said, "'I must borrow your seat for a time.' The Speaker rose, and fell upon his knee before the King, the members standing bareheaded, while the King sat down in the Speaker's chair. Charles looked keenly round the house, but none of the five members were to be seen. They had been warned, and were not there. He called them each by name. Only silence answered. "'Mr. Speaker,' said Charles at last, "'where are those five members whom I have called? Are any of them in the house? Do you see them?' "'Your Majesty,' said the Speaker, again falling upon his knees, "'I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the house may be pleased to direct me. Ah, said Charles, I see the birds are flown. Then, after making a very angry and bitter speech, he left the house. As he passed out, the silence was broken by cries of rage, for the people felt that the king was trampling on all their rights. The quarrels grew worse and worse and at last war broke out, war between Britain and Britain. English, Scots, and Irish all joined in this war, and it was called the Great Rebellion. The King and the Lords were on one side, and the Parliament and the people on the other. Those who followed the King were called Cavaliers, or Royalists. 
those who followed the Parliament were called Parliamentarians or Roundheads. Cavalier comes from a word which means horse, and the Cavaliers were so called because most of them rode upon horses. The Roundheads were so called because they wore their hair short instead of long and curling, like the Cavaliers. The Roundheads were for the most part Puritans, while the Cavaliers belonged to the Church of England. At this time there was no regular army in Britain, such as we have now, and a great many of those who fought were quite untrained. The King's army was in some ways better than the army of the Parliament, for it contained many gentlemen who were accustomed to danger, and who were able to ride. The Parliamentarians were chiefly working men who knew very little about fighting, but among them there was a brave strong man called Oliver Cromwell. He knew how hard it would be for these working men to conquer, if they were not taught how to fight, so he drilled them and taught them quickness and obedience. So thoroughly did they learn that they became most splendid soldiers, and were called Oliver Cromwell's Ironsides. Never were such strange soldiers seen. In those days a camp was a wild, rough place, but from the camp of Cromwell's soldiers, instead of the sound of drunkenness and laughter, came the sound of psalm-singing and prayer. To many of them the war was a holy war, a battle for the freedom of religion. "'Trust in God and keep your powder dry,' was Cromwell's advice to his soldiers, as one day they were crossing a river to attack the enemy. For four years the war went on. The royalist leaders were Lord Lindsay and the king's nephew, Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert was so fiery and eager in battle that he was called Dashing Prince Rupert. But although he was very brave, he was not a good general, and often did rash things. The chief of the roundhead leaders were Oliver Cromwell, Ireton, and Fairfax. Many battles were fought, sometimes one side winning, sometimes the other. But at last, at a battle called Nazaby, the Cavaliers were utterly defeated. Then Charles lost all hope. He had no money left and very few friends. He felt that his cause was ruined, and thinking that the Scots would be kinder to him than the English, he gave himself up to them. The Scots and the English were still friends, and they agreed that if Charles would grant to England the same kind of religion as Scotland, they would set him on the throne again. But Charles would not promise this, so the Scots gave him up to the Parliamentarians. When the war was over, it was found that neither king nor Parliament ruled the land, but the army. The king being now a prisoner, the Parliament said there was no longer any need for the army, and told the soldiers to go back to their homes. But the soldiers refused to go. They knew how powerful they had become, and they resolved to become yet more powerful, and get possession of the king. One evening a man called Cornet Joyce, with about eight hundred soldiers behind him, rode to the house in which King Charles was kept prisoner. Going into the king's room, he told him politely and kindly that he had come to take him away. After some talk Charles said he was willing to go, but as it was now late, Cornet Joyce must come again in the morning. Accordingly, at six o'clock next morning, the king rose, and, going out to the courtyard, found Joyce and all his soldiers waiting there, mounted and ready. "'I pray you, Mr. Joyce,' said the king, as he looked at the company of stern men in steel armour, "'deal honestly with me, and show me your commission.' By a commission— the king meant a letter to say that Joyce really had orders to take him away. "'Here is my commission,' said Joyce. "'Where?' said the king. "'Here,' said Joyce. "'Where?' again asked the king. "'Behind me,' said Joyce, pointing to the mounted soldiers. "'I hope it will satisfy your majesty.' Then Charles smiled and said, "'It is as fair a commission and as well written as ever I have seen a commission in my life. "'It may be read without spelling. "'But what if I refuse to go with you? "'I hope you would not force me. 
I am your king, and you ought not to lay violent hands upon your king. I acknowledge none to be above me here but God. We will not hurt you, your majesty, replied Joyce. Nay, we will not even force you to come with us against your will. So Charles consented to go with them, and asked, How far do you intend to ride to-day? As far as your majesty can conveniently ride, replied Joyce. I can ride as far as you or as any man here, said Charles, smiling, and so they set out. In this way the king became the prisoner of the army, instead of the prisoner of the parliament. End of chapter 77 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On Monday, August 21st, 2006 at Hugh McGuire's house in Montreal, Canada. Our Island Story, Chapter 78 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 78. The Story of How the King Was Brought to His Death. God gives not kings the style of gods in vain, for on the throne his sceptre do they sway. And as their subjects ought them to obey, So kings should fear and serve their God again. If then ye would enjoy a happy reign, Observe the statutes of our heavenly King, And from his law make all your laws to spring. If his lieutenant here ye would remain, Reward the just, be steadfast, true and plain, Repress the proud, maintaining I the right, Walk always so as ever in his sight. Who guards the godly, plaguing the profane, And so shall you in princely virtue shine, Resembling right your mighty king divine. This poetry was written by James to his son, And perhaps it would have been better, Both for James and Charles, Had they tried to rule as the poem says kings ought to rule. After Charles became the prisoner of the army, letters and messages passed continually between him and Parliament, and between him and the leaders of the army. Both parties offered to replace the king upon the throne, if he would only promise them certain things. But these things Charles would not promise, for all the time he was secretly plotting with his friends, and hoping to free himself. The leaders of the army treated Charles very kindly, allowing him to see his friends, and to have a great deal of liberty. This made it easy for him to escape, which he did, and fled to Carisbrook Castle in the Isle of Wight. But although he thought that he was going to friends, he found that he was again a prisoner, and more carefully guarded than before. The struggle for power between Parliament and army still went on, but Cromwell was master of the army, and he meant to be master of Parliament too. So one day, when Parliament was about to meet, a man called Colonel Pride surrounded the house with soldiers. As they arrived, each member, who would not do exactly as Cromwell and the other army leaders wished, was seized and turned away. When this was done, there were only about fifty members left. This was called Pride's Purge, because he purged or cleaned away all those who did not think exactly as he did. It was still the long Parliament that was sitting, but people now called it the Rump Parliament, because it was not a real Parliament, but only part of one. Cromwell was master of King and Parliament, but the army was too strong even for him. Against his will he was driven to do a deed from which he shrank. He was driven to condemn the King to death. Charles was accused of high treason against the nation, and was brought to London to be tried. This was a crime which had never been heard of before, as high treason means a crime against the ruler. More than a hundred men were called as judges of the king, but scarcely half of them came. Many of them were angry with Charles, and wished him to be punished, 
but the punishment for treason, they knew, was death, and they did not wish the king to be killed. The judges assembled at Westminster Hall, and King Charles was brought before them as a prisoner. They, who had always stood bareheaded in his presence, now sat with their hats upon their heads, seeing that Charles too kept on his hat, but it was seen that his hair, which had been very beautiful, had grown grey, and that he looked old and worn. Charles had been foolish, he had been wicked, but now in the face of death he behaved with the dignity of a king. The men who sat before him, he said, had no right to judge or condemn him. He would not plead for mercy. Three times he was brought before the court, three times he refused to plead. At last the judges, without further trial, sentenced him to death as a tyrant, a traitor, a murderer, and a public enemy. Calm and dignified as ever, Charles walked out of the hall after the sentence had been pronounced. "'God bless your majesty!' cried a soldier as he passed, and was struck by his officer for daring to say such words. "'Methinks,' said the king, pausing and smiling at the man, "'the punishment is greater than the fault.' Three days later, Charles the king walked for the last time through the streets of London, from St. James's Palace to Whitehall. The way was lined with soldiers. Soldiers marched in front of him and behind him. The air was filled with the noise of trampling feet and the sound of drums. The scaffold was raised outside the palace of Whitehall, and hundreds of people crowded to see the dreadful end of their king, some in joy, very many in grief and awe. Charles knelt by the block amid deep silence, when a man in a black mask held up the king's head, crying, "'Behold the head of a traitor!' a groan burst from the shuddering crowd. He nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene, but with his keener eye the axe's edge did try. Nor called the gods with vulgar spite to vindicate his helpless right, but bowed his comely head down as upon a bed. End of chapter 78 Our Island Story, chapter 79 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 79. The Commonwealth. The Adventures of a Prince. King Charles was beheaded on the 30th of January, 1649 A.D., and Parliament immediately proclaimed that kings were bad and useless, so England would have no more. The government would be a commonwealth. Common here means belonging to all, and wealth, although we now use it to mean money, at one time meant well-being or happiness. Commonwealth really means the well-being or happiness of all. No one was to be greater than another. All were to be equal. The House of Lords was, therefore, they said, useless and dangerous, and they did away with it. They also made it a crime for any one to call Prince Charles king, although he was the eldest son of Charles I. The people of Scotland and Ireland, however, were very angry when they heard what had happened. The Scots had never wished the king to be killed. They had hoped to force him to rule better. Now that he was dead they proclaimed his son Charles king. At the same time the Irish rebelled, and Cromwell and his Ironsides went to subdue them. Very many of the Irish were Roman Catholics, and some years before they had risen and cruelly murdered the Irish Protestants. Cromwell hated the Roman Catholics, and he intended now to punish them for their cruelty to the Protestants, as well as for rebelling against the Commonwealth, as the government of Britain was now called. Cromwell remained nine months in Ireland, and so cruel and pitiless was he that for many years no Irishman could hear his name without a shudder and a curse. The country was utterly subdued. Many of the people were killed, others were sent as slaves to the West Indies, 
and all who could fled to far countries to escape the fury of Cromwell. When he had finished this dreadful work, Cromwell returned to England, and then marched into Scotland. The Ironsides had never been defeated, and now they won battle after battle, and at last Charles decided to march into England and fight for his crown there. Cromwell was very much astonished when he heard what Charles was doing, and he hurried after him as fast as he could. The English did not flock to join Charles as he had expected, and when the two armies met at Worcester, Cromwell's army was nearly twice as large as that of the prince. A dreadful battle followed. The Scots fought gallantly for their prince, but they were utterly defeated. Hardly any escaped, and those who were not killed were sold as slaves." Cromwell called this battle his crowning mercy, for with it Charles lost all hope of regaining his kingdom. It was fought on what Cromwell used to think was his lucky day, the 3rd of September. Charles fled from Worcester, and had many adventures before he reached safety. Great rewards were offered to any one who would tell where he was hiding. Punishment and death threatened those who helped him yet so many were faithful to him that he escaped. He cut off his beautiful hair, stained his face and white hands brown, and instead of silk and satin he put on coarse clothes, which were much patched and darned, so that he looked like a labouring man. Then, with an axe over his shoulder, he went into the woods with four brothers, who really were working men, and pretended to cut wood. All day long they stayed in the wood, and at night the four brothers guided the prince to another place. There they found so many of Cromwell's men that it was not safe for Charles to stay in a house. That night he slept in a hayloft. Next day, finding that even there he was not safe, he climbed into an oak tree and lay among the branches. As it was September the leaves were very thick and hid him well. Charles lay very still and quiet. His heart thumped against his ribs, and he held his breath when some of Cromwell's soldiers rode under the tree. They were so close that he could hear them talk. "'The Lord hath given the ungodly one into our hands,' said one. "'Yea, he cannot be afar off. "'We will use well our eyes. "'Perchance the Lord may deliver the malignant even unto us.' But the kind green leaves kept close— and little did the roundheads think that the very man for whom they were looking was close above their heads, and could hear every word they said. For a whole long day Charles lay in the oak, and at last Cromwell's men, having searched and searched in vain for him, went away. Then Charles climbed down from the tree and walked many weary miles till his feet were blistered and sore, and his bones ached. At length he reached the house of a royalist lady and gentleman who were kind to him. The lady pretended that she had to go on a journey to visit a sick friend. Charles was dressed as her servant, and mounted upon a horse, and the lady got up behind him. In those days, before there were trains or even coaches, ladies very often travelled like this. They did not ride upon a horse by themselves, but mounted behind a servant or a friend. For many miles Charles travelled as this lady's servant, having many adventures and escapes by the way. As Charles was supposed to be the servant, he had, of course, to look after the horse. One evening, as he went into the stable-yard of the inn in which they were to spend the night, he found it full of Cromwell's men. One of them looked hard at the prince. "'My friend,' he said, "'I seem to know your face.' "'Like enough,' replied Charles.' "'I have travelled a good deal with my masters.' "'Surely,' said the man, "'you were with Mr. Baxter?' "'Yes,' replied the prince calmly. "'I was with him. "'But now make way, my man, till I see after my beast. "'I will talk to you later.' So Charles busied himself with his horse, and escaped from the man who took him to be a fellow-servant. After many dangers— Often being recognized in spite of his disguises, the prince arrived at Lyme Regis, and there a little boat was found to take him over to France. But when the captain's wife heard who was going to sail in her husband's boat, she was afraid. 
She was afraid that Cromwell might hear of it, and perhaps kill her husband. So she told him he must not go. "'I must go,' said the captain. "'I have promised.' "'You shall not go,' said his wife, and, seeing that talking did no good, she locked him into a room and took the key away. Charles and his friends waited in vain for the captain, and at last they left Lyme Regis in despair. After more adventures they reached Brighton, and there they really did find a boat and a captain willing to take them over to France. The evening before starting Charles was having supper at a little inn in Brighton when the landlord came behind him and kissed his hand. Again he had been recognized, but the landlord was faithful and would not betray him. "'God bless your majesty,' he said. "'Perhaps I may live to be a lord, and my good wife a lady.' He thought that if Charles ever came back to the throne he would not forget those who had helped and served him when he was poor and in trouble. For more than six weeks Charles had travelled in fear and danger among his bitter enemies. In spite of his disguises many people had recognised him, yet not one had betrayed him. Instead they had taken a great deal of trouble, and run many risks to help and save him, and now his difficulties and dangers were over. Very early next morning, while it was still almost dark, the little party crept down to the shore. In the grey dawn Charles stepped on board the boat, the sails were set, and slowly he was carried away from his kingdom, which he was not to see again for many long days. End of chapter 79 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On Monday, the 21st of August, 2006 At Hugh McGuire's house in Montreal, Canada Our Island Story, Chapter 80 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 80 The Commonwealth, the Lord Protector The British had hardly done fighting at home, when they had to fight with enemies abroad. They went to war with the Dutch, who at this time had a very famous admiral called Van Tromp. The English, too, had a famous admiral, called Blake. The Dutch and the British had several reasons for quarrelling. Each tried to spoil the trade of the other. and The Dutch would not acknowledge the new British government. This made the Parliament very angry. Several fierce battles were fought at sea, and when the Dutch won, Van Tromp hoisted a broom to his masthead, as a sign that he intended to sweep the British ships from the seas. Blake and the English were very angry at this. They built and manned more ships as fast as they could, and once more sailed out to fight the Dutch. When the two fleets met, the fiercest, longest battle of this sea war took place. For three days they fought, but in the end Blake was victorious, and bravely though he had fought, Van Tromp was obliged to lower his proud broom, and sweep the remainder of his own fleet homeward. It was now about four years since King Charles had been beheaded. Cromwell was the strongest man in the country, yet no real ruler had been appointed, and the Rump Parliament was acting neither wisely nor well. Cromwell made up his mind to put an end to this. So one day he marched to Parliament at the head of about three hundred of his soldiers. He himself went into the house leaving some of his soldiers at the door, some in the lobby, and some on the stairs. He sat down in his usual place, and listened for some time to the talking. Then suddenly he rose up and began to speak. He told the Parliament that the things which they did were unjust, that they were tyrants and worse. "'But your hour hath come,' he cried. "'The Lord hath done with you.' and putting on his hat he stamped with his foot, and the soldiers rushed in. "'I will put an end to your babbling,' he shouted, and at a signal from their master the soldiers drove the members out of the hall, 
Cromwell calling out insulting names at them as they passed. The speaker refused to leave the chair, and tried to address the members, but in the noise and confusion he could not make himself heard. Then one of Cromwell's friends took him by the arm, and forced him to go. In a few minutes the hall was cleared of every one, except Cromwell's soldiers and followers. On the table lay the mace. The mace is the sign of the dignity and the lawfulness of Parliament. It is carried before the Speaker as he enters, and leaves the house, and lies on the table while the members talk together. It is a sign of law and order, just as the sceptre is the sign of royalty and rule. Cromwell did not like any form of ceremony. He thought it was foolish and wicked. "'Take away that bauble,' he said angrily, pointing to the mace. So it was removed. Cromwell's friends then left the house, he himself coming last and locking the doors after him. This was the end of the long Parliament. It had lasted for thirteen years.' Cromwell and his friends now set to work to form a new Parliament, and one more to their liking than the last had been. Instead of allowing the people to choose the members, Cromwell himself chose them. But this Parliament did not please him much better than the last, and in less than five months it was again dissolved. Cromwell was now asked to become ruler. Some of his friends wished him to take the title of king, but he refused chiefly because he knew that his greatest friends were the soldiers, and they hated the name of king. If he took that name, he was sure that they would turn against him and become his worst enemies. So he became ruler under the title Lord Protector. Cromwell was not crowned and anointed as kings were, but there was a very solemn service held, when a beautiful purple robe was placed upon his shoulders. The sword of office buckled to his side, and the sceptre put into his hand. He was truly king in everything but name. Cromwell was not only a king, but a very stern and autocratic one. He wanted his own way quite as much as the Stuarts had done, only he really thought of the good of the country, and the Stuarts thought only of themselves. The troubles of the Civil War now began to pass away, and under the stern rule of the Lord Protector, Britain began once more to be peaceful and prosperous at home, and famous abroad. All the Protestants of Europe looked to Cromwell for help and protection, and so powerful was his name that he could always give help. Kings bowed and obeyed when Cromwell commanded, and Britain was famous as she had not been since the days of Elizabeth. Her soldiers were the best in the world, her admirals won for her the name of Mistress of the Seas, a name which she has kept ever since. Yet the man who had won this great place for Britain lived in terror of his life. He was a tyrant, and like all tyrants he was bitterly hated, and he knew it. Under his clothes he wore armour, he always carried weapons, and wherever he went he was followed and surrounded by a strong bodyguard. No one ever knew where he would sleep, for he moved about from room to room in his great palace, lest someone should attack him while he rested. At last, worn out in body and brain, the great Lord Protector died on 3rd of September, 1658 A.D. It was his lucky day. He first put arms in religion's hand, and timorous conscience unto courage manned. The soldier taught that inward mail to wear, And fearing God how they should nothing fear. Those strokes, he said, will pierce through all below, Where those that strike from heaven fetch their blow. Astonished armies did their flight prepare, And city strong were stormed by his prayer, In all his wars needs must he triumph when, He conquered God still ere he fought with men. End of part 80 Our Island Story, Chapter 81 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org This reading by Kara Schallenberg 
Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter eighty one Charles the Second How the King Came to His Own, and How Death Walked in the Streets of London. Oliver Cromwell had been so strong and powerful that it seemed quite natural to the people to choose his son, Richard, as the next protector. But Richard was a very different man from his father. He had not that in him which makes a great soldier or a great ruler. The army, the parliament, and the people soon found this out, and troubles began. In a few months, Richard gave up his office of protector. And went away to live quietly in his house in the country. The people were tired of being ruled by the army. They were tired of the gloom and the sternness of the Puritans. They remembered with regret the days of Charles I, when people dressed in gay colours, when they sang and played, when it was not thought wicked to have Christmas games or village dances, and they longed for these days to come again. They forgot how cruel and bad Charles had been. They remembered that he had a son, the son whom the Scots had already crowned king. General Monk, who had ruled Scotland under Cromwell, saw that many of the Scots had never forgotten their king. So, thinking great things but saying little, he began to march to London. The Parliament and the army were already quarrelling, and as Monk passed through England, People flocked to him from all sides, begging him to try to bring peace and order into the country again. This was what Monk meant to do. How he had not settled, but letters and messages were secretly passing between him and Charles, who was at this time living in Holland. At last Monk reached London, and one day, when Parliament was sitting, he entered the house and told the members that there was a messenger at the door with a letter from Charles. Amid great excitement, the messenger was brought in, and the letter read. It promised pardon to all those who had rebelled against Charles I. It promised freedom to all to worship God as they thought right. It seemed to bring once more the promise of happiness and peace to Britain. The people rejoiced and shouted, God save the king! The Commonwealth was at an end. Britain had a king again. A few days later, Charles landed at Dover, where he was met by Monk, and, mid the cheers and rejoicing of the people, rode to London. Charles landed upon his birthday, the twenty ninth of May, sixteen sixty A.D., and people thought it was a good sign that he should have arrived upon such a happy day. The soldiers alone did not rejoice. They had always hated the name of king, they hated it still. And when Charles the Second rode gaily into London, the army, which was drawn up on Blackheath to do him honour, stood sullen, gloomy, and silent. For more than ten years the army had been the greatest power in the country, but Charles saw that, because the soldiers disliked him, for him it was a danger rather than a safeguard. So he disbanded the army, and sent the soldiers back to their homes. Charles was very glad to return to his own country. From being poor and homeless, he had become the ruler over one of the greatest kingdoms in the world. But in spite of all he had suffered, he had not learned to be kind or good. As soon as Charles was safely on the throne, he forgot all the promises which he had made. Many of the people who had helped to put Charles I to death were punished, some of them being beheaded. The old quarrels about religion began again as fiercely as ever, for the king was a Roman Catholic at heart, although he dared not own it, and pretended to belong to the Church of England. The new parliament was called the Cavalier Parliament, because it was so full of the king's friends, and they made laws which were very hard for the Puritans and Presbyterians. Scotland suffered much from these laws, and Charles sent a cruel man, called Lauderdale, to govern for him there. He, helped by another man called Claverhouse, tortured and put to death all those who would not worship God as the king commanded. During the reign of Charles the Second, there was another war between the Dutch and the British. The Dutch had good ships, brave sailors and brave leaders. The British, too, were brave, but their ships were badly managed. 
The money which should have been used to pay and feed the sailors was wasted by the king and his friends. The war, however, went fiercely on, sometimes one side, sometimes the other having the best of it. But the Dutch grew very bold, and at last sailed up the Thames, burning and destroying many of the British ships. Then, for the only time in all history, the roar of an enemy's guns was heard in London. The people went mad with fear and shame and anger. They thought the kingdom itself was threatened, and, recalling the days of Cromwell, asked themselves if he would have suffered an enemy so to insult his country. But the danger passed, and peace was made. While this war was going on, a terrible sickness called the plague broke out in London. It began in winter time. At first, no one thought much about it, for such sickness was common in those days when people were careless about keeping their houses and towns clean. But as the days became warmer, the plague became worse, and soon it was so terrible that all who could fled from the town. It was a dreadful time. No business was done. The shops were shut, the churches were empty. The streets, which used to be so full of people hurrying to and fro, were silent, deserted, and grass-grown. As soon as it became known that any one in a house had the plague, all who lived in that house were forbidden to leave it, lest they should carry the dreadful sickness to others. Then the door was marked with a great red cross, and the words, The Lord have mercy on us. At night the awful silence of the streets was broken by the sounds of heavy rumbling carts, and the mournful cry of the men in charge of them, "'Bring out your dead! Bring out your dead!' For those who had died of this sickness could not be buried in a peaceful green churchyard, where their friends could come to put flowers upon their graves. There were far too many of them for that. Those who died during the day were carried away in a cart at night, and buried all together in a great grave which was dug for them outside the town. The story is told of a boatman who, when his wife became ill of the plague, could no longer go near his house, but slept in his boat. He worked hard all day, and in the evening used to bring what he had earned and lay it upon a stone not far from his house. Then he would go a little distance off and call to his wife. When she heard his call, she sent one of their children out to take the money and the food which he had brought. They would speak to each other for a short time at a distance, and then the boatman would go away again, sad at heart, wondering if his wife and children would still be alive when he came again next evening. But at least he knew that his dear ones would not die of hunger, as so many of the poor people did whose friends had run away and deserted them. This dreadful sickness was greatly caused, and made much worse, by the dirt of the streets and the houses. In those days no one thought of keeping the streets clean. People threw all the rubbish from their houses into them, and there it lay rotting and poisoning the air. The streets, too, were very narrow, and windows small, so that little air or light could come into the houses. In fact, people never thought about fresh air and light. The doctors did not know how to cure this sickness. Make-believe doctors offered the people all kinds of medicines which could do no good, but which were eagerly bought. Many went mad with terror and horror, and at one time a thousand people died every day. But at last the dreadful summer passed, and, with the coming of the winter and the frost, the terrible sickness gradually disappeared. End of chapter 81 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 21st, 2006, at Hugh McGuire's house in Montreal, Canada. Our Island Story, Chapter 82. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 82 The Story of How London Was Burned After the plague had passed away, another dreadful misfortune happened to London, 
At least at the time it seemed like a misfortune, but really it was a good thing. This was the great fire, which caused much of the city to be burned to the ground. Many of the dirty houses and narrow streets were destroyed, and with them the last remnants of the dreadful plague were also burned away. When the houses were built again, they were made better, and the streets were made wider, so that the great fire was not altogether a misfortune. The fire first broke out in a baker's shop, as most of the houses were built of wood, and the summer had been unusually hot and dry. The flames spread very fast. They leapt from house to house, and the people, seeing that it was useless to try save their dwellings, tried rather to save their furniture and belongings by carrying them to other houses. But sometimes, as soon as they had done this, the fire would attack these too, and the people had to fly still further away, often in the end losing all that they possessed. For three days and nights the fire blazed and roared. A great cloud of smoke hung over the city by day, but at night there was no darkness, for the flames made it brighter than by day. The air was hot and stifling, and at last no one could go near the fire, so great was the heat. The earth seemed a blazing furnace, and the sky as if it was beaten out of burning copper. To stop the fire seemed impossible. It must burn and burn until nothing more was left to destroy, so houses were pulled down in order to make a gap between the burning ones and those which were still safe. But the work went on too slowly, and before the gap was big enough, the fire had reached the workers, and they had to flee for their lives. At last, someone thought of the plan of blowing up the houses with gunpowder. This was done, and when the hungry flames reached the open spaces left by the houses which had been destroyed, they died away, for they could not overleap the ruins and attack the houses beyond. So the roar and crackle of the flames ceased, and the great cloud of smoke rolled away, but London from the tower to Temple Bar was left a smouldering blackened ruin, and two hundred thousand people were homeless. In memory of the great fire, a monument was raised on the spot where it first broke out, and may still be seen to this day. So fearful were people at that time about plots, and so bitter was the feeling about religion, that many thought that the fire had been caused on purpose by the Roman Catholics. But there was never any real reason for believing this, and now everyone thinks that it happened by accident. About this time the King of France became very greedy, and wanted more land and power than he had a right to possess. To prevent him succeeding in his plans, to get these, three other countries in Europe joined together, forming what was called the Triple Alliance. The three countries were Britain, Holland and Sweden. Triple means three, and alliance means to join together, and the Triple Alliance was called so because three countries joined together. As you know, the French and English were old enemies, and this alliance pleased the English, so that Charles was forced to join it, although he really did not care whether the French king was powerful or not. Charles thought most about his own pleasure. He spent a great deal of money, and he could not always make the commons give him more when he wanted it. Now he thought of a new way of getting money. He wrote secret letters to the King of France, offering to break with the Triple Alliance and to help him to fight against the Dutch. This he said he would do if the King of France would promise to give him a large sum of money every year. The King of France promised, and so Charles disgraced himself and his country, not only by breaking his word, but by becoming the servant of the King of France. Openly, he pretended to be a Protestant, and the friend of Protestants. Secretly, he was a Roman Catholic, and the friend of Roman Catholics. For a time, Charles kept up the pretense of the Triple Alliance, and by telling the Parliament that he must have more sailors in order to keep a check upon the French King, he got a large sum of money from them. He got still more money in other wicked ways, and then, to the anger of the people, he made war on the Dutch. But if France was greedy, and Britain false, Holland was strong and stubborn. Bravely she fought under her great leader, William Prince of Orange. In two years Charles came to the end of his money, 
and he was forced to sign a peace called the Peace of Westminster, and leave France to fight alone, but he still continued to receive money from the French king. Charles was called the Merry Monarch, because he was gay and laughter-loving. The people were glad at first to have so gay a king, for they were tired of the stern ways of Cromwell and the Puritans. But they soon found out that Charles was selfish and wicked as well as gay, and his reign proved a very unhappy one for Britain. There was constant discontent, there were constant plots. The king plotted, Parliament plotted, Protestants plotted, and Catholic plotted. But out of all the misery and discontent and injustice of these years, one good thing at least grew. This good thing was the passing of the Habeas Corpus Act. It was indeed no new act. It was as old as the great charter of King John. But like much in that great charter, it had been set aside by king after king. By this act, no person could be put into prison and left there as long as the king pleased, or until he was forgotten by all his friends. It commanded that every person should be brought to trial, and either punished or set free. Habeas corpus is Latin for have his body, and means that the body of the prisoner must be brought into court at a certain time to be tried, instead of being left in prison for a long, long time, or perhaps sent into slavery and exile without any trial, or any chance of proving himself innocent. This act is at least one good thing to remember of the reign of Charles the Second, who died in 1685 A.D., having reigned for twenty-five years. He died as he had lived, careless, witty, laughter-loving. He was clever, and it is said that he never said a foolish thing, and never did a wise one. He was lazy, selfish, and deceitful, a bad man, and a bad king. Yet Charles found both men and women to love him during his life, and to sorrow for him at his death, because he was clever, good-tempered, and had pleasant manners. End of chapter 82 Our Island Story, chapter 83 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 81. James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland. The Fiery Cross. When Charles the Second died, he left no sons who might succeed him, so his brother James, Duke of York, came to the throne. James was a Roman Catholic. During the reign of Charles the Second, an act had been passed forbidding Roman Catholics to hold any public office, yet in spite of this law James was made king. James promised that he would not hurt the Protestant churches. He allowed a bishop of the Church of England to crown him, but part of the coronation service was missed, that part at which the king used to receive a Bible and be told to read and believe it. The new king's cruel character soon began to show itself. By his orders, and in the name of religion, Claverhouse continued to murder and torture the Scots in most terrible ways, because they refused again to accept the teaching of the English church. More wicked still, in England a man called Chief Justice Jeffreys, by his cruelties made for himself a name which has never been forgotten. He was a monster, an ogre more fierce and terrible than in any fairy tale. But James was not allowed to take possession of the kingdom without a struggle. In Holland, numbers of Protestants who had been driven out of Britain in the reign of Charles the Second were gathered together. They felt that now was the time to return and fight, for they knew that many of their fellow countrymen must hate a Catholic king. One of these exiled Protestants, a brave Scotchman called the Earl of Argyll, agreed to raise an army in Scotland, and an English noble called the Duke of Monmouth agreed to raise one in England. Monmouth thought that he had a better right to the throne than James, and with the help of Argyle he hoped to be able to drive James from the throne and become king himself. The English people knew and loved Monmouth, and indeed during the life of Charles there had been a plot to set him upon the throne. 
when everything was arranged, the Earl of Argyle sailed from Holland with his little band of followers, and landed in Scotland. He was one of the most powerful of the Scottish nobles. Although when he had fled from the country in the reign of Charles, the king had taken his land and money from him, he knew that he could trust to his clan to rise and follow him as soon as he returned. In those days there were no telegraphs, and no postmen. There were even few roads among the wild highlands of Scotland, and few people could read. So when a chief had need of his men he gathered them by means of a sign which all could understand. This sign was the fiery cross. A rough cross was made from the wood of a yew tree. The ends of this cross were set alight, and afterwards the flames were put out by being dipped in the blood of a goat. The chief with his own hands then solemnly gave the cross to a swift runner. This man took it, and ran as swiftly as he could to the next village. When the men of this village saw the fiery cross, they said, "'Our chief has need of us,' and they at once prepared for battle, while the fiery cross was put into the hands of another swift runner, who carried it over hill and glen to the next village. On and on it went through all the countryside, the men in each village and farmhouse understanding what was needed of them, and— without a word, gathering to their chief. So it was that the clan Campbell gathered round their chieftain, Mac Cullum Moore, as they loved to call Argyle. But although the Earl's men were loyal to him, those who had come from Holland with him to serve as his captains would not agree, and would not obey. Their foolish jealousy of their leader was so great that his army became disheartened, and was scattered almost before there had been any real fighting. The earl was once more forced to flee. Dressed as a peasant, and followed by only one faithful friend, he tried to escape. But as they were crossing a little river, they were seized by some of the king's soldiers. The earl, to save himself, sprang into the water, but the soldiers followed him. He was armed only with pistols, and in his spring into the water the powder had been wet, and they would not fire. He was struck to the ground and taken prisoner. When Argyle saw that it was useless to struggle any more, he called out, "'I am the Earl of Argyle!' He knew what a great name his was, and he hoped that even the king's soldiers would tremble before it, and let him go. But his name could not save him, and he was led a prisoner to Edinburgh. There the judges tried in vain to make him tell who were with him in the rebellion. He would not tell, and he was condemned to death. Bravely and calmly he met his fate. One of the last things he did was to write to his wife. Dear heart, forgive me all my faults, and now comfort thyself in him in whom only true comfort is to be found. The Lord be with thee, bless and comfort thee, my dearest. Adieu. On his grave were carved some lines which he himself wrote the day before he died. Although Argyle had refused to give the names of the other leaders of the rebellion, many were seized and beheaded. To one of them James said, "'You had better be frank with me. You know it is in my power to pardon you.' "'It may be in your power, sire,' replied the man, "'but it is not in your nature.' The man was right. James never forgave. End of chapter 83 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 26, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Our Island Story, Chapter 84. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 84. James II of England and Seventh of Scotland. The Story of King Monmouth. A few days after Argyle reached Scotland, the Duke of Monmouth sailed from Holland and landed in England. He was received with great joy. The common people flocked to his standard, many of them armed only with scythes, and pruning-hooks fastened to poles. Nine hundred young men marched before him, twenty beautiful girls gave him a Bible splendidly bound, 
and a banner which they had themselves embroidered. The roads wherever he went were lined with cheering crowds. A Monmouth, a Monmouth, the Protestant religion, they cried, as he passed. The Duke's followers begged him to take the title of king. So, on 20th of June, 1685 A.D., the same day on which Argyle was laid captive through Edinburgh, Monmouth was proclaimed king at Taunton, a little town in the south of England. But like the real king, he was named James. So instead of calling him King James, his followers called him King Monmouth. King Monmouth did not enjoy his title long. In the dark of the early morning of the 6th of July, a battle was fought between King James's men and the followers of Monmouth on the plain of Sedgemoor. Monmouth fought bravely, but when he saw that his men were being defeated, he turned and fled away, leaving them leaderless and hopeless. This was the last real battle ever fought on English ground. Monmouth tried to escape in disguise. He changed clothes with a poor shepherd, but the country was so full of the king's soldiers that he found it impossible to get away. For several days he lived in the fields, hiding in ditches, and having nothing to eat but raw peas and beans. At last, miserable and ragged, half starving from cold and hunger, he was discovered by the soldiers and taken prisoner to London. Bound with a cord of silk, he was led before King James, and falling upon his knees he begged for mercy and forgiveness. But James never forgave. Monmouth, like so many other men, good and bad, was beheaded. The anger and vengeance of the king did not end with the death of Monmouth. His soldiers, under a dreadful man called Kirk, tortured and murdered in a terrible manner the poor rebels who escaped from Sedgemoor. Judge Jeffreys followed next, and so many people did he kill, such terrible things did he do, that his journey through the country was for ever after called the bloody assize. Assize means court of justice. At certain times in England, judges make what is called a circuit, or journey through the country, when they hear what wrong things people have done, and when they judge and punish. But on this dreadful journey, Judge Jeffreys did not do justice. He did wrong and murder, and King James praised and rewarded him for it. End of chapter 84 Our Island Story Chapter 85 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 85 James the Second of England and the Seventh of Scotland. The Story of the Seven Bishops. Having put down two rebellions, James made up his mind to turn Britain into a Roman Catholic country once more. It was against the law for a Roman Catholic to hold any public office, but, in spite of that, James began to turn away Protestants from many posts, and to put Roman Catholics in their places. The people grew more and more angry, but still James took his own way, growing bolder and bolder. At last he issued what was called the Declaration of Indulgence. In this declaration he said that all the laws against the Roman Catholics, and against all others who did not belong to the Church of England, and who were called dissenters, were done away with. James hated the dissenters, that is, the Puritans and Presbyterians, but he thought that if he made them free they would side with him, and help him to free the Romish Church also. But they did not do so. They knew that James was breaking the laws of the land in issuing this declaration, and they would not accept freedom in an unlawful manner. The king ordered the declaration to be read in all London churches on Sundays, the 20th and 27th of May, and in all country churches on Sundays, the 3rd and 10th of June. But nearly every clergyman in London, and in the country, refused to obey. After a great deal of talking and consulting, seven bishops wrote out a paper, which they all signed. 
In this paper the bishops told the king that they could not obey him, not because they wished people who thought differently from themselves to be cruelly and unkindly treated, but because the laws against these people had been made by Parliament. They had been passed by king, lords, and commons, and could only be recalled by the consent of king, lords, and commons. The king alone, they reminded him, had no power to recall a law, and in ordering the clergy to read the Declaration of Indulgence in the churches, the king was ordering them to break the law. This they refused to do. By the time that this letter was written and signed, it was late on Friday evening. There was no time to be lost, and the bishops took it at once to the king. He received them kindly, but when he read the letter his face grew dark and angry. "'This is rebellion,' he said. "'Sire,' said the bishops, "'we are not rebels. We are true to your majesty. We wish to keep the laws of the land.' "'I tell you it is rebellion,' repeated James. Then one of the bishops, who was called Trelawney, fell upon his knees. "'Sire,' he cried, do not say so hard a thing to us. No Trelawney can be a rebel. Remember that my family has fought for the crown. Remember how we served your majesty against Monmouth. We are ready to die at your majesty's feet, cried another. We helped to put down one rebellion. Why should we raise another? This is rebellion. This is rebellion. I will be obeyed, replied the king, growing more and more angry. I will keep this paper. I will remember you who have signed it. You are rebels. Go. The bishops went. But that very night copies of the letter which they had written to the king were printed and sold to thousands of joyful people, who in reading it knew that seven brave men were fighting for their freedom. On Sunday morning the excitement was great. People crowded to the churches in thousands. Would the clergy read the declaration, or would they not, was the question which everybody asked. It was soon answered. In only four of the hundred London churches was it read. In these four churches, as soon as the first words were heard, the people rose and streamed out, so that when the reading was at an end the churches were silent and empty. A week passed. The second Sunday came. Again thousands thronged to the churches. Again the declaration was unread. Excitement grew. Another week passed. Would the country churches read the declaration, or would they not? That question, too, was answered. The country clergy, like the London clergy, refused, and the land from end to end seemed to be filled with an outburst of joy. Then the king ordered the seven bishops who had written the letter, and who had set the brave example, to be sent to the tower. As soon as this became known, the whole river was crowded with boats, and the banks thronged with people eager to see the bishops as they passed on their way to prison. When the bishops appeared, the people fell on their knees, begging for a blessing. All the way from Whitehall to the tower the air was full of shouts of, "'God bless your lordships!' It was like a royal procession, rather than like rebels being led to prison. As the bishops entered the traitor's gate, the guards knelt before them, begging too for a blessing, and in the guard-house the rough soldiers drank to the health of the brave bishops. All the next day, to the anger of the king, great people crowded to visit the bishops, to cheer and comfort them in prison. And when ten of the chief dissenters went to see them, his anger knew no bounds. He called these dissenters before him to scold them, and ask what they meant by visiting their enemies. "'We are all Protestants,' they replied. "'It is our duty to forget old quarrels, and stand by the men who are fighting for the liberties of the Protestant religion.'" For a week the bishops were kept in prison, while all over the country people wondered anxiously what would happen to them. Bishop Trelawney belonged to Cornwall, the people there loved him very much, and they made a song about him, of which the chorus was, "'And shall Trelawney die? And shall Trelawney die? Then thirty thousand Cornish boys will know the reason why.'" 
After being kept in prison for a week, the bishops were brought to court to be tried. The excitement was tremendous. The king and his friends did all they could to have the bishops punished, but it was in vain. The judges and the jury said that the bishops had done no wrong, and they were set free. From street to street the joyful news spread like wildfire. Bells rang, cannon boomed, bonfires blazed, people cheered and wept and sang. Another battle had been fought for freedom, another victory won, and all England seemed mad with the joy of it. At night the houses were lit up. In nearly every window a row of seven candles appeared, one candle for each bishop. The streets were filled with rejoicing people, and not until day dawned, and the bells began to ring for morning service, did the weary, happy crowds go to their homes. End of chapter 85 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On August 26, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story, Chapter 86 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 86 James the Second of England and Seventh of Scotland William the Deliverer Anyone could see that the people were everywhere ready for rebellion. The king alone would not see it, and went on in his own way. He was angry and sullen, but very obstinate. I will not give way, he said. My father lost his head by giving way, and he resolved to punish the people. But James had gone too far. The people were weary of a popish tyrant, and they made up their minds to have a Protestant king. So they asked William prince of orange to come to rule over them the prince against whom charles the second had fought in the dutch wars william had some claim to the throne i will explain how charles the first had a daughter called mary she married a prince of orange called william and their son also called william was now prince of orange he was thus the nephew of charles the second and of james the second and besides this, he had married his cousin Mary, the eldest daughter of James the Second. Although their father, James, was a Roman Catholic, Mary and her sister Anne were both Protestants. And except for their little brother, who was at this time a tiny baby, Mary was the next heir to the throne of Britain. So when the British saw that James meant to rule as a tyrant, and that there was no hope of any freedom or happiness for them as long as he was king they sent messages to holland begging william to come to take the crown william consented to come and began to gather his ships and men and one day a letter reached james telling him what the prince of orange was doing as james read he turned pale and the letter dropped from his hand he had thought that he might ill-treat the people as he liked. Now he discovered his mistake, and tried to undo the evil he had done. It was too late. His people had forsaken him. William was ready to sail, but for some days he was prevented because of the wind which blew from the west. At last it changed, and what was known for many years after as the Protestant east wind began to blow. It blew the prince and his great fleet to the shores of Britain. More than six hundred ships swept over the water, led by William in his vessel called the Brill. From the masthead floated his standard, with the arms of Nassau and of Britain upon it, and in great shining letters the words, I will maintain the liberties of England and the Protestant religion. By night the dark sea glittered for miles with lights. 
by day the white sails glimmered in the wintry sun once before in our story a great conqueror called william had sailed to these shores with mighty ships and men this was no conqueror but a deliverer on the fifth of november sixteen eighty eight a d william landed at torbay in devonshire there the stone upon which he first placed his foot is still to be seen although now it is a town then it was a little lonely village and the prince had to sleep the first night in a tiny thatched cottage but over it as proudly as over any castle fluttered the great banner with its promise i will maintain the liberties of england and the protestant religion through rain and wintry weather over roads knee-deep in mud the prince and his army marched northward worn wet and muddy as they were the people crowded everywhere along the way to cheer them the prince rode upon a beautiful white horse a white feather was in his hat and armour glittered upon his breast his face was grave and stern his eyes keen and watchful he looked a soldier and a king as he rode along an old woman pushed her way through the crowd and afraid neither of the prancing horses nor the drawn swords of the soldiers darted to the side of the prince she seized his hand and looking up into his face with eyes full of tears cried i am happy now i am happy now and the grave and stern william smiled gently as he looked down upon her the deliverer had come james the second his queen and their little boy fled to france no one wanted james no one regretted him to go to france was the best thing he could do and the king there received him kindly and treated him as an honoured guest at westminster a parliament was called which arranged that william and mary should be king and queen together for although mary had the better right to the throne she did not wish to reign without her husband nor did he wish to accept a lower rank than that of his wife so ended the glorious revolution it had been brought about with hardly any fighting at all and the war between the king and parliament was at an end for william and mary received the throne by the will of parliament end of chapter eighty six our island story chapter eighty seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 87 William the Third and Mary the Second. The Story of Brave Londonderry. Although most of the people received William and Mary joyfully, some, chiefly in Ireland and Scotland, still looked upon James as the rightful king. In Ireland especially there were many Roman Catholics who would not acknowledge a Protestant king. The king of France hated William, so he helped James with money and ships, which enabled him to set out for Ireland to win his kingdom again. James landed at a town called Kinsale, and the Irish people welcomed him with great joy. But he felt disheartened almost at once, for there had already been much fighting, and the country through which he had to pass was desolate and deserted, and at times he and his men could find hardly enough food to keep them from starving. Most of the Protestants had fled from the land, or had shut themselves up in the two towns of Enniskillen and Londonderry. The soldiers of James besieged both these towns, but it was round Londonderry that the greatest fight took place. Londonderry is on a river called the Foyle, and the enemy not only surrounded the town on the land side, but they built a bar across the river, so that no ships could come to the town with food or help. The walls were weak, and the cannon few, and the Irish thought that the town could not hold out for long. The governor, too, was a cowardly man, and did his best to dishearten the people, until it was suspected that he was a traitor. 
Indeed, he would have given in, but a brave old clergyman called Walker marched into his pulpit one morning with a sword in one hand and a Bible in the other, and preached such a rousing sermon that the people took heart and never lost it again through all the long weeks of hunger and suffering which they had to endure. It was a dreadful time. The people had hardly anything to eat, but they held bravely on, hoping against hope that help would come to them from England. But day after day passed, and no help came. Rats, mice, dogs, and horses, all were eaten, only tallow and skins remained. Still they held on. The soldiers were so weak at last from want of food that they could hardly stand, far less fight. They resolved to hold out for two days longer. Then the end must come. But just as the sun was setting on the 28th of July, the day before they were going to give in, the eager watchers on the walls saw the gleam of sails far down the river. Help! Help at last! How their hearts beat! How they shouted with all the little strength they had, as nearer and nearer sailed the ships! There were three of them. On they came with all sail set. But how could they pass the dreadful bar which lay right across the river? On they came. One ship called the Mountjoy took the lead, and sailing with all its force it crashed against the boom, as the bar was called. With a tremendous noise the boom shivered and cracked, but the Mountjoy was not strong enough to break it through. The shock was so fierce that the ship was thrown backward and stuck in the mud, for the river was shallow. A groan rose from the people on the walls, and their hearts grew sick with disappointment and fear, while the Irish soldiers on the bank cheered with triumph. But as the Mountjoy was thrown back, the second ship followed, and dashed at the spot which the Mountjoy had hit. The boom, which was already cracked, gave way, and, amid the noise of joyful cheers and of tearing, splintering wood, she sailed gaily over. Londonderry was saved. That same night eager hands unloaded the ships, and, for the first time for three months, the people had enough to eat. A day or two later the army of James burned the tents and cabins in which they had lived while besieging the town, and went away. But the struggle was not over. It lasted until the following year, when William himself came to Ireland. Then there was a great battle between the soldiers of James and the soldiers of William. It was called the Battle of the Boyne, because it was fought near a river of that name. James was beaten, and fled again to France, and William, with the crown upon his head, entered Dublin, the acknowledged King of Ireland. End of chapter 87 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On September 7, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story, Chapter 88 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 88 William the Third and Mary the Second The Story of a Sad Day in a Highland Glen The friends of James were called Jacobites, from Jacobus, which is Latin for James. There were many Jacobites in the north of Scotland. They rose under Claverhouse, the man who had treated the Covenanters so badly, and a battle was fought at Killiecrankie Pass. The Jacobites won the day, but their leader was killed, so although many of the clans continued to be discontented, they were without a leader, and could do little. The discontent and rebellion went on for a year or two, and at last William determined to put an end to it. He proclaimed that he would forgive all those who had rebelled, if they would take an oath, before 1st of January, 1692 A.D., acknowledging him as king, and promising to live quietly and peacefully under his rule. Those who did not take the oath would be punished. All the Highland chieftains, except the chief of the Macdonalds of Glencoe, took the oath, 
This chief was very unwilling to own William as king, and he could not bring himself to do so until the very last day. Then he started off from his lonely glen, and went to the nearest town, where he expected to find one of the king's officers to whom he could swear the oath. But to his dismay he found that he had come to the wrong town, and that there was no one there who could receive his oath. He started off again as quickly as he could to go to the right town, but it was deep winter, and travelling was very slow in those days, and he was six days late when he arrived. However, his oath was accepted, and he went home feeling safe and happy. But a man called the Master of Stair, who was governing Scotland for William and Mary, hated all Highlanders, and the Campbells, another clan, hated the Macdonalds. So the Campbells and the Master of Stair decided that as the chief had been a few days late in swearing to obey William, they had a good excuse for killing all the Macdonalds. William was not told that Macdonald had sworn. He was made to believe that he had not done so, and that the whole clan was a set of robbers, and he signed an order for them to be destroyed. Although it is said that William did not know what he was doing when he signed this order, he ought to have known, and the massacre of Glencoe, as it is called, is the darkest spot on his reign. The master of Stair had the king's order, but he did not do his work openly. He sent Campbell and his men to live in Glencoe for nearly a fortnight, so that MacDonald should suspect nothing. The old chief received the men kindly, and treated as his guests those who were ready to betray and murder him. At five o'clock, one dark winter's morning, the Campbells crept silently out of the houses, and along the snow-covered paths to the scattered cottages. A few minutes later the glen was awake with the sounds of shots and screams. Campbell and his soldiers were at their work. Without mercy, men were killed almost in their sleep. Those who were able fled through the darkness and the snow with their wives and children, many of them only to die of cold and hunger among the lonely mountains and glens. The soldiers murdered all they could. Then they set fire to the empty houses, and marched away, driving before them the cattle and horses belonging to the Macdonalds. And when the sun rose high over the valley of Glencoe, it shone only on blood-stained snow, and blackened smoking ruins, where peaceful homes had been but a few hours before. For some time, Britain and France had been at war, for the French king hated William and would not acknowledge him as king of Britain. William spent a part of every year abroad, directing this war and ruling Holland. While he was gone, Mary ruled in England. She governed so well and was so sweet and gentle that the people loved her dearly. They loved her far more than they loved William, who was so quiet and stern as to seem almost sullen. But in 1694 A.D., Mary became ill of a very dreadful disease, called smallpox, and died in a few days. William had loved her very much, and he was very sad when she died. I was the happiest man on earth, he said to one of his friends. Now I am the most miserable. She had no fault, none. You knew her well, but you could not know. Nobody but myself could know her goodness. And if the king sorrowed, the whole country sorrowed with him. After the death of Mary, William ruled alone. At last the king of France made peace with William, perhaps because he was tired of fighting, perhaps because he was a little tired of helping James, who was really very dull and stupid. By this peace, the French king consented to acknowledge William as the rightful king of Britain, and to give back the lands he had wrongfully taken from Germany, and the other countries he had been fighting against. A few years later, James died, and Louis the Fourteenth, the French king, forgot the promise he had made to William. He proclaimed the son of James to be king of Britain, under the title of James the Third. This made the British very angry, although it really did not matter much, a French king might call James King of Britain, but that could not make him so truly. 
However, William wanted to go to war with France again for another reason, and this act of the French king decided the people to do so. This other reason was that the king of Spain had died, and Louis wanted to make his own grandson king of Spain, so that France and Spain should in time come to be one kingdom. But some of the kings in Europe thought that it would be most dangerous to allow this, as then the king of France might become too powerful, and want more than ever to take lands which did not belong to him. So William and the other kings of Europe formed what was called the Grand Alliance, and the war which now began was called the War of the Spanish Succession, because the quarrel was about who should succeed to the throne of Spain. But before war was declared, William died. He had always been rather ill, although in spite of that he had both thought and worked hard, and for some time now he had been very unwell. One day, when he was out riding, he was thrown from his horse, and broke his collarbone. This might not have hurt a strong man, but William was not strong, and a few days later, 8th of March, 1702 A.D., he died. William was a great and brave man. He did much for Britain, yet he was never loved by the people. They felt that he was a Dutchman, and that he cared more for Holland than for his kingdom of Britain, and that made it difficult for them to love him. End of chapter 88 Our Island Story, Chapter 89 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 89 Anne How the Union Jack Was Made. William and Mary had no children, so Mary's sister Anne, the younger daughter of James the Second, succeeded to the throne. From the very beginning of her reign Britain was at war with France, and indeed not only Britain, but all Europe was fighting on one side or the other. The British troops were led by a famous soldier called Marlborough. He won many battles, the chief of which were called Blenheim and Ramy. This war of the Spanish succession went on for more than ten years, till all Europe was weary of fighting, and many places where there had been houses and gardens and green fields were nothing but deserted wildernesses. At last a peace was made, called the Peace of Utrecht. By this treaty Louis acknowledged Anne as the rightful Queen of Britain, and also promised to send James the Pretender, as the son of James the Seventh was called, out of his kingdom, and not to help him any more. Once before Louis had promised something very like this to William, and he did not keep his promise. There were other agreements in this treaty, one of them being that Britain should keep the strong fortress of Gibraltar in Spain, which has belonged to the British ever since. Marlborough was a famous soldier, but he was also a great statesman, and indeed he and his wife, the Duchess of Marlborough, ruled the Queen for many years. He was brave and clever, but he was greedy and not quite honest. He made many enemies, who succeeded at last in having him disgraced, and both he and his wife were sent away from court. The Duchess had a very bad temper, and she was so angry when she had to leave court that she smashed all the furniture in her rooms, and threw the Queen's keys at the Duke's head when he was sent to ask for them. It was no wonder that the Queen, who was gentle and kind, had been afraid of the Duchess, and had been ruled by her. Other clever men succeeded Marlborough, and another clever woman succeeded the Duchess, for Queen Anne was not a strong-minded woman, and she allowed herself to be ruled and led by favourites and statesmen. Like Queen Elizabeth, she had many great men around her, and although they thought more perhaps of making themselves famous and powerful than of what was best for the country, still the country prospered. The greatest thing that happened in the reign of Anne was the union of the parliaments of England and Scotland. 
Since 1603 A.D., when James VI of Scotland became King of England, there had been very little real union between the two countries. For union means oneness, and although there had been only one king, there had been two parliaments, one in England and one in Scotland, each making laws. Sometimes the Scottish Parliament would make laws which the English Parliament thought were dangerous. Sometimes the English Parliament would make laws which the Scottish Parliament did not like. It almost seemed at times as if the union of the crowns had done no good at all, and the two countries were ready to quarrel and separate. Wise men saw that there could be no real union until there was only one Parliament, until English and Scots met and discussed the laws together. Cromwell, indeed, had called English, Scottish, and Irish members to his Parliament, but it had been for so short a time, and in such troubled days, that people had almost forgotten about it. Even now it was not an easy thing to do, but at last all difficulties were smoothed away. It was agreed, among other things, that each country should keep its own law courts and its own religion, but that they should have the same king, the same parliament, the same money, and the same flag, and that the country should be called Great Britain. The English flag was a red St. George's cross upon a white ground. The Scottish flag was a white St. Andrew's cross on a blue ground. So, to make one flag, the two crosses were placed one on the top of the other, and they made something very like the Union Jack, but not quite. The Union Jack was not complete until the Irish cross of St. Patrick, which is the same as a St. Andrew's cross, but was red on a white ground, was added to the other two. Then the flag we love was complete. The reason we call our flag the Union Jack is because James the Sixth used to sign his name in French, Jacques, which sounds very like Jack. His two flags, the English and the Scottish, came to be called the Jacks, and when the two were made one, the flag was called the Union Jack. When the Queen gave her consent to the Act of Union, as it was named, she called both lords and commons together, and made a speech to them. I desire and expect from all my subjects of both nations that from henceforth they act with all possible respect and kindness to one another, that so it may appear to all the world they have hearts disposed to become one people. This will give me great pleasure. Then the last English Parliament rose, and, on the 23rd of October, 1707 A.D., the first British Parliament met. It was a great state ceremony. Each Scottish lord was led to his place by two English lords. The Queen in her royal robes made a speech from the throne in which she heartily welcomed the new members, and ever since that day, in spite of difficulties and troubles, England and Scotland have really been one country. Queen Anne died on the 1st of August, 1714 A.D. She was not a great queen, yet her reign will always be remembered as great. Like Elizabeth, she had clever men as her soldiers and advisers, and, as in the time of Elizabeth too, there were many writers whose books are still remembered and read. End of chapter 89 Read by Kara Schallenberg and Two Noisy Parakeets On September 7, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Our Island Story, Chapter 90 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 90 George I, the story of the Earl of Mar's hunting party. Queen Anne was the last of the Stuarts, and her husband and all her children died before she did. She had no near relatives, except her brother, who was called the Pretender. He was a Roman Catholic, and therefore could not succeed to the throne, for in the time of William and Mary a law had been made that no Roman Catholic should ever again wear the crown. 
the people had foreseen that after Queen Anne died there might be quarrels as to who should reign next. So that too had been settled by law in the time of William and Mary. James I of England had a daughter called Elizabeth, who married the King of Bohemia, and her grandson, George, Elector or King of Hanover, was the nearest Protestant heir to the throne. He was the great-grandson of James the Sixth. So, as soon as Queen Anne died, George was proclaimed King in England, Scotland, and Ireland, without any fighting or quarrelling. But although his grandmother had been British, George himself was as German as could be, and he could not even speak a word of English. He was fifty-five years old when he came to the throne, and was too old ever to learn the English language, or English ways and manners. The Jacobites had never lost hope of having once more a Stuart king. Now they felt was the time to try. The new king was a German, and the people, they thought, would surely rather have a man of their own country than an old German to reign over them. The Earl of Mar, making believe that he was going to have a great hunting party, asked a number of the Highland lords to his house. They came, but soon it was seen that it was not deer they meant to hunt, and a large army gathered round Lord Mar and the standard of James the Eighth, which was the title the pretender took. In their caps they wore his badge of wicade, or rosette. The pretender's standard was of blue silk, having on one side the arms of Scotland worked in gold, and on the other side the Scottish thistle, with the motto, Nemo me empun lacessit, which means, those who touch me will suffer for it. It also had two streamers of white ribbon, on one of which were the words, for our wronged king and oppressed country, and on the other, for our lives and liberties. There was great rejoicing when the standard was unfurled, but scarcely had it been done when the golden ball fell from the top of the staff. This made the Highlanders very sad, for they were superstitious, and thought it meant bad luck. But when our standard was set up, so fierce the wind did blow, Willie. The golden knop down from the top, and to the ground did far, Willie. Then second-sighted Sandy said, Well, din a good at our, Willie, while pipers play frae right to left. Fifurrock wigs away, Willie. In the north of England, Lord Derwentwater and another gentleman gathered an army of Jacobites, and proclaimed James King. But neither Lord Mar nor Lord Derwentwater were good generals. Having got their soldiers together, they did not seem to know what to do with them. So when King George's army met Lord Derwentwater's army, the Jacobites yielded almost without a struggle. In Scotland the Jacobites under Lord Mar, and the King's soldiers under the Duke of Argyle, met at a place called Sheriff Muir, near Dunblane. Lord Mar called a council of war, and asked his captains, "'Shall we fight, or shall we go back?' And all the captains called out, "'Fight! Fight!' Lord Mar agreed, and they all went to their places. No sooner did the Highlanders know they were to fight than a great cheer went through the army, every man tossing his cap in the air. Every Scotchman there was glad at the opportunity of fighting his old enemies, the English. With broadswords drawn, colours flying, and bagpipes playing, they rushed to battle. But brave and fierce though the Highlanders were, they lacked a clever leader. So it happened that one half of Mars soldiers beat one half of Argyles, but the other half of Argyles beat the other half of Mars, so each side claimed the victory. There some say that we won, some say that we won, some say that none won at our man. But one thing I'm sure that at Sheriff Muir, a battle there was which I saw, man. And we ran, and they ran, and they ran, and we ran, and we ran, and they ran away, man. If we have not gained a victory, said one Jacobite general, we ought to fight Argyle once a week until we make it one. But Mar did nothing, and James, who had promised to come from France, did not arrive. So disappointed and discontented, many of the chieftains and their followers went home again. But at last James landed. 
he was greeted with great joy, and rode into Dundee with three hundred gentlemen behind him. Now, thought the Jacobites, we have a king. Now we will be led to battle and victory. But they were again disappointed. James was no soldier. He was pale, grave, and quiet. He never smiled, and he hardly ever spoke. The men soon began to despise him, and to ask if he could fight or even speak. Day after day passed, and nothing happened. "'What did you call us to arms for?' asked the angry Highlanders. "'Was it to run away? What did the king come for? "'Was it to see his people butchered by hangmen, and not strike one blow for their lives? "'Let us die like men, and not like dogs.' If our king is willing to die like a king, there are ten thousand gentlemen who are not afraid to die with him. But it was of no use. Nothing was done. The pretender, taking the Earl of Mar with him, slunk back to France, a beaten man, for want of courage to strike a blow. And sad and angry, the Jacobite army melted away. Some of the leaders escaped to foreign lands, others were taken prisoner to the tower, and afterwards beheaded. Amongst those were Lord Derwentwater. This rebellion is known as the Fifteen, because it took place in 1715 A.D. Oh, far frae me hame, full soon will I be. It's far, far frae hame in a strange country, where I'll tarry a while, return, and with ye be. And bring many jolly boys to our own country. O shall success till I again ye see. May the lusty highland lads fight on and ne'er flee. When the king sets foot aground and returns from the sea, then you'll welcome him home to his own country. God bless our royal king from danger, keep him free. When he conquers all the foes that oppose his majesty. God bless the Duke of Mar and all his cavalry, who first begun the war for our king and our country. Let the traitor king make haste and out of England flee, with all his spurious face come far beyond the sea. Then we will crown our royal king with mirth and jollity, and end our days in peace in our own country. End of chapter 90 Our Island Story, Chapter 91. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall, Chapter 91. George the Second, The Story of Bonnie Prince Charlie. George I died in 1727 A.D., and was succeeded by his son, George II. Like his father, he was very German, but he could speak a little English. He had a very clever wife called Queen Caroline, and she helped him to rule. He had also a very clever prime minister called Walpole. Walpole had begun to be powerful under George I, and although George II did not like him, he still remained in power. He was the first peace minister Britain ever had. Instead of urging the king and people to fight, he tried in every way he could to keep the peace. He saw that the best thing for the country was to be at peace. He saw that it was best for the people to have time to sow and reap, to build ships, to make goods, and to trade with other countries, and that they could neither have time nor money to do this if they were always fighting. So he would not fight and Britain grew prosperous. But the people did not all think as Walpole did. A quarrel with Spain arose, and, try how he might, Walpole could not keep the peace, and war was declared. Strange to say, the people rejoiced at the news. They decorated their houses, lit bonfires, and rang bells as if some great good fortune had befallen the country. "'They may ring their bells now,' said Walpole sadly, but they will soon be wringing their hands. The peace which had lasted twenty years was broken, and Walpole was quite right when he said that the people would soon be wringing their hands, for the war with Spain was a miserable failure, and brought much trouble and sorrow upon them. 
This war was followed by another, called the War of the Austrian Succession. The Emperor of Austria died, leaving his kingdom to his daughter, Maria Theresa. But some of the kings of Europe thought that they would take her lands from her, and make their own kingdoms greater. To prevent this, the British fought for Maria Theresa against France and Spain, and George the Second and his soldiers defeated the French in a battle called Dettingen. This is the last battle in which a British king led his soldiers himself. People began to see that kings could serve their countries in better ways than by fighting. While this war was going on, the Jacobites tried again to set James Stuart upon the throne. This time it was not James, but his son Charles, who landed in Scotland. He came with only seven followers, and at first the people were afraid and unwilling to follow him. But Charles was very different from his father. He was gallant and brave and handsome. He talked and smiled and won his way to the brave Highland hearts, till he was at the head of fifteen hundred men, all willing and ready to die for their king and prince. "'Go home,' said one old chieftain to him when he first landed. "'There is no safety for you here.' "'I have come home,' replied Prince Charlie. "'Charles Stuart,' he said to another chief, called Cameron of Lochiel, "'has come to claim his own and win the crown of his ancestors, or die in the attempt. "'Lochiel, if he chooses, may stay at home and learn the fate of his prince from the newspapers.' "'No,' replied Lochiel, "'no, I will share the fate of my prince, and so shall every man over whom I have power.' "'So in a dark highland glen the standard of the prince was raised.' It was red silk, and on it were the proud words, Tandem triumphans, which means, Triumphant at last. And as the red silk folds fluttered out on the mountain breeze, it was greeted by the sounds of bagpipes, and the shouts of the people. Then raise the banner, raise it high, for Charles will conquer or will die. The clans allele and true men be, and show me who will daunten thee. Our good King James will soon come hame, and traitors ah be put to shame. All Scotland shall again be free, there's none on earth can daunt in thee. After the raising of his standard, Charles marched south till he reached Edinburgh, his army growing as he went. Lochiel and his followers marched into Edinburgh, and there, at the market cross, amid the cheering of some of the people and the sullen silence of others, James the Eighth was once more proclaimed King of Scotland. A beautiful lady on horseback, with a drawn sword in her hand, gave the white cockade to those who crushed round her, impatient to enter the service of the prince. Later in the day Charles himself rode into the town, and the people crowded to meet him, cheering and weeping, eager to kiss his hand or touch his clothes, covering even his boots with tears and kisses. The castle of Edinburgh was held by the soldiers of King George, and as the prince reached Holyrood, the old palace of the Stuarts, a cannon from the castle thundered out, and a shot struck the wall of the palace not far from where Charles stood. But he was neither startled nor afraid, and, turning, walked quietly into the palace. That night the prince gave a ball. The old palace, which had stood so long empty and silent, was gay with lights and flowers. The sounds of laughter and music were heard there, perhaps for the first time since the days of the beautiful Mary, Queen of Scots. Lovely ladies and brave men crowded to see and do honour to their bonny Prince Charlie, and they went away happy if they had touched his hand or heard his voice. But there were other things to do besides dancing. The army of King George, under Sir John Cope, had landed at Dunbar and was marching to Edinburgh. Charles decided to march out to meet him. Early on the morning of the 20th of September, the Highlanders rose and made ready for battle. Prince Charlie placed himself at their head, and, drawing his sword, cried, "'Gentlemen, I have thrown away the scabbard.' By that he meant that there was no turning back, and that his sword would never again be sheathed until he conquered or died, and the men, hearing the words, shouted and cheered as they followed him. Next day a battle was fought at Prestonpans, near Edinburgh. Prince Charlie and his men were up so early that they were ready to attack before Sir John Cope and his soldiers were prepared. 
The Highlanders gave them no time to prepare, but charged so fiercely and quickly that in about five minutes the battle was over. The soldiers of King George ran away, and Charles won a complete victory. Sir John ran away too, and was the first to bring the news of his own defeat to Berwick. Cope sent a challenge fra Dunbar. Charlie, meet me on ye dar, and I'll learn ye the art of war, if ye'll meet me in the morning. Hey, Johnny Cope, are ye waking yet? And are your drums a-beating yet? Oh, haste ye up, for the drums do beat. Oh, fie, Cope, rise up in the morning. When Charlie looked the letter upon, he drew his sword the scabbard from. Come follow me, my merry merry men, and we'll meet Johnny Cope in the morning. When Johnny Cope to Berwick came, they speared at him. Where's I your men? If faith, he say, I dinna ken, I left them a this morning. Now, Johnny, troth you were ne bleat, to come with the news o your own defeat, and leave your men in sick a strait so early in the morning. A few hours after the battle, the Highlanders were back in Edinburgh, marching up and down the streets, playing, The King shall enjoy his own again, on the bagpipes. All the Jacobites rejoiced, and thought that they had really triumphed at last. End of chapter 91 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On September 9, 2006, in Oceanside, California Our Island Story, Chapter 92 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall Chapter 92 George II The Story of Flora MacDonald To your arms, to your arms, Charlie, yet shall be your king. To your arms, all ye lads that are loyal and true, to your arms, to your arms, his valour nane can ding, and he's on the south, we are jovial crew. For Master Johnny Cope, being destitute of hope, took horse for his life and left his men. In their arms he put no trust, for he knew it was just that the king should enjoy his own again. To your arms, to your arms, my bonny highland lads, we winna brook the rule o' a German thing. To your arms, to your arms, wi' your bonnets and your plaids, and hey for Charlie, and our ain true king. After the battle of Preston Pans, Charles returned to Edinburgh, and remained there for some days, gathering men and money. It was a gay time. There were constant balls and parties, and bonny Prince Charlie was loved more and more each day. The bonny prince, who could eat a dry crust, sleep on peas' straw, take his dinner in four minutes, and win a battle in five, was toasted everywhere. At last Charles and his army were ready and marched into England. But although no one resisted him, although he took several towns without a blow being struck, hardly any of the English joined him. The Highlanders grew weary of marching through strange country, and homesick for their mountains, and many of them deserted and went home. By the time Charles reached Derby, the leaders were so disheartened that they persuaded him to turn back to Scotland. Yet the people in London were awaiting his coming in terror, and King George was ready to run away. It is difficult to guess what might have happened had the prince gone on, but he did not. He turned again towards Scotland, and began the long, sad march homeward. The wearied army reached Glasgow at last, having marched six hundred miles through snow and rain and wintry weather in less than two months. Charles now decided to take Stirling Castle. He met the king's army at Falkirk, and defeated them. But after that, instead of trying to take Stirling, as he had intended, he listened to the advice of some of the Highland chiefs, and marched northward. As Charles had defeated two generals, King George now sent his own son, the Duke of Cumberland, to command his army. At Culloden, near Inverness, the last Jacobite battle was fought. The royal army was much larger than the Jacobite one, and although the Highlanders fought with all their usual fierce courage, they were utterly defeated. 
Charles would have been glad to die with his brave followers, but two of his officers seized the bridle of his horse, and forced him against his will to leave the field. The battle was turned into a terrible slaughter, for the Duke of Cumberland behaved so cruelly to the beaten rebels, that ever after he was called the Butcher. The Stuart cause was lost, and Bonny Prince Charlie was a hunted man. The king offered thirty thousand pounds to any one who would take him prisoner, but although the money would have made many a poor Highlander richer than he had ever imagined it possible for any one to be, not one of them tried to earn it. Instead, they hid their prince, fed him, clothed him, and worked for him. At last, after months of hardships and adventures, he escaped to France. Many people helped Prince Charles, but it was a beautiful lady called Flora MacDonald, who perhaps helped him most. She served him when he was most miserable and in greatest danger. The whole country round was filled with soldiers searching for him. He scarcely dared to leave his hiding place, and was almost dying of hunger. No house was safe for him, and he had to hide among the rocks of the seashore, shivering with cold and drenched with rain. With great difficulty and danger to herself, Flora MacDonald reached the place where the prince was hiding, bringing with her a dress for him to wear. The prince put it on, and together they went to the house of a friend, where Flora asked if she and her maid Betty might stay that night. This friend was very fond of Flora, and very glad to see her. She was a Jacobite, and when she was told who Betty was, she made ready her best room for the prince. A little girl belonging to the house came into the hall, while Betty was standing there, and ran away frightened at the great tall woman, but no one suspected who she was. Disguised as Flora MacDonald's maid, Prince Charlie travelled for many days, escaping dangers in a wonderful way, for the prince made a very funny-lucky woman. He took great strides, and managed his skirt so badly, that in spite of the danger, his friends could not help laughing. "'They do call your highness a pretender,' said one. "'All I can say is that you are the worst of your trade the world has ever seen.' When there was no need for Flora to go further with the prince, they took a sad farewell of each other. "'I hope, madam,' said he, bending over her hand and kissing it, "'we shall yet meet at St. James's. By that he meant that he still hoped to be king some day, and welcome her in his palace of St. James's in London. Then he stepped into the boat, which was waiting for him, and Flora sat sadly by the shore, watching it as it sailed farther and farther away. Far over yon hills are the heather so green, and down by the corry that sings to the sea. That bonny young Flora sat sighing her lane, the dew on her plaid and the tear in her eye. She looked at a boat which the breezes had swung, away on the wave like a bird on the men. And I, as it lessened, she sighed and she sang, Farewell to the lad I shall ne'er see again, Farewell to my hero the gallant and young, Farewell to the lad I shall ne'er see again. The target is torn from the arm of the just, The helmet is cleft on the brow of the brave, the claim all forever in darkness must rust, but red is the sword of the stranger and slave. The hoof of the horse and the foot of the proud have trod all the plumes in the bonnet of blue, why slept the red bolt in the heart of the cloud, when tyranny revelled in blood of the true. Farewell, my young hero, the gallant and good, the crown of thy fathers is torn from thy brow. This rebellion is called the Forty-Five, because it took place in 1745 A.D. Prince Charlie reached France safely, but the rest of his life was sad. He was a broken, ruined man, and he lived a wanderer in many lands. At last he died in Rome on 30th of January 1788 A.D., the anniversary of the day on which Charles I had been beheaded. In St. Peter's at Rome there is a monument placed there, it is said by King George the Fourth, upon which are the names in Latin of James the Third, Charles the Third, and Henry the Ninth, kings of England. They were kings who never ruled, and are known in history as the Old Pretender, the Younger Pretender, and Henry Cardinal of York, brother of the Young Pretender.
End of chapter 92 Our Island Story, Chapter 93 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Our Island Story by H. E. Marshall. Chapter 93 George the Second. The Story of The Black Hole of Calcutta. Besides the civil war, Britain had other wars to fight. France, England's old enemy, was still the enemy of Britain. Once again there was war between them, and this time the fighting was not in France, nor in England, nor on the seas, but in far-off lands. Long ago, in the days of Elizabeth, you remember that Englishmen sailed over the seas to the newly discovered country of America, and made their home there. You remember how Raleigh claimed Virginia for England, and how later the stern Puritans sailed away in the Mayflower, and founded a new Plymouth and a new England over the sea. Little by little these colonies, as such new countries which are peopled by an old country are called, grew. Towns sprang up, harbours were built, and the colonies became a rich and powerful part of Great Britain. In another country, called India, Britain had also possessions, and trade with India had become of great importance, and was carried on chiefly by a company called the East India Company. But France, too, had colonies in India and in America, and the French and the British became so jealous of each other that war broke out in both countries. The French were much stronger in India at this time than the British, and they made up their minds to drive the British away altogether. They might have succeeded, too, but for the cleverness of a young man called Robert Clive. He was a clerk in the East India Company's office, and not a particularly good clerk either, because the work he had to do was not at all the kind of work for which he was fitted. When war broke out, Robert Clive gave up being a clerk and became a soldier, and he soon showed that he was a clever one. Some of the native Indians fought for the French and some for the British, but Clive and his sepoys, as the native soldiers were called, won, and the French governor was obliged to leave the country. A few years later one of the native princes who had fought for the French attacked the British who were living in Calcutta. He killed many of them, destroyed their houses and factories, and those who were left alive he shut up in a horrible prison called the Black Hole. There were one hundred and forty-six prisoners, and the black hole was so small that there was hardly room in it for them to stand. The windows were so tiny that hardly any air could come through them. When the prisoners were told that they were all to go into this dreadful place, they could not believe it. They thought at first that the prince meant it as a jest. But they soon found out that it was no jest, but horrible, sinful earnest. In spite of their cries and entreaties, they were all driven in and the door fastened. It was a hot summer night. What little air came through the tiny windows was soon poisoned by being breathed over and over again. People fainted, went mad, died. The cruel Indians held torches to the windows, and, looking in, laughed at the terrible sufferings of the poor prisoners, who cried for mercy as they beat upon the door, trying vainly in their agony to break it down. In the morning only twenty-three came out from the dreadful hole alive. When Clive heard of this horrible deed, he marched against the native prince, and utterly defeated him in a battle called Place. He drove him from his throne, and placed another prince, who was friendly to the British, upon it. He drove the French from their fortress there, and ever since then the power of Britain has grown and grown in India, until today our king, the King of Great Britain and Ireland, is also the Emperor of India. End of chapter 93 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On September 9, 2006 In Oceanside, California Our Island Story, Chapter 94 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story, Chapter 94, George II, The Story of How Canada Was Won. While these things were happening in India, the French and British were fighting in America also. The French colonies there were called Canada and Louisiana. Canada lay north of the British colonies, beyond the St. Lawrence River. Louisiana lay west of the British colonies, beyond the Mississippi River. If you look on the map, you will see that in this way the British colonies were quite shut in by the sea and by the French on all sides. This did not please the British. They wanted to be able to enlarge their colonies and to stretch out to the west, to the great forests and unknown land beyond Louisiana. The French, on the other hand, hoped to drive the British away from America altogether, and they built forts along the rivers and lakes to keep them as far as possible from the west. There were many quarrels which grew more and more bitter, till at last war broke out. At first the British were not successful, but just as Walpole had been a great peace minister, so William Pitt, who was now in power, was a great war minister. He was quick to see what needed to be done, and just as quick in choosing the best men to do it. He did not ask whether a man was rich or powerful, or whether he had great relations. He asked, Is this the best man I can find to do this piece of work? So it came about that at this time the British all over the world were successful. Among the men whom Pitt sent to fight in America was a young man called James Wolfe. Wolfe was sent from England with 8,000 soldiers, and was told that he must take Quebec, the capital of Canada. He reached Canada and sailed up the St. Lawrence, greatly to the surprise of the French, for it was a very difficult passage, full of rocks and banks of sand. Yet Wolfe took his great warships, where the French would have feared to venture with their little trading vessels. He anchored opposite Quebec, and landed his soldiers on the island of Orleans. Quebec was a very strong town. It was built upon rocks high above the river, and was defended by the great French general Montcalm. For a long time Wolfe tried in vain to take the town. Montcalm was too clever and watchful. Day by day passed, and Wolfe grew ill with care and weariness. Many of his soldiers were killed, and the fresh troops, which he expected, did not arrive. At last he decided upon a bold and daring plan. There was one place which the French did not guard very strongly, because they thought it was quite impossible for the British to attack them there. This was a steep cliff, but Wolfe noticed there was a narrow pathway up this cliff, and he decided to take his soldiers by that path. He felt so doubtful of success, however, that he wrote a sad letter home before he made the attempt. "'I have done little for my country,' he said. "'I have little hope of doing anything, but I have done my best.' One dark night, the British soldiers were rowed over the river. No one spoke. Everyone moved as quietly as possible. The oars even were muffled, so that the sound of rowing might not be heard by the French. Only Wolfe, as his boat went silently down the river, repeated a poem to his officers in a low voice. The poem was called An Elegy in a Country Churchyard, and it had been written a few years before by an English poet called Gray. The curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea, The ploughman homeward plods his weary way, And leaves the world to darkness and to me. Now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight, And all the air a solemn stillness holds, Save where the beetle wheels his droning flight, And drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. That is how the poem begins. It is a long poem, and very beautiful. And when Wolfe had finished repeating it, he turned to his officers and said, Now, gentlemen, 
I would rather be the author of that poem than take Quebec. The boat reached the Quebec side of the river, and Wolfe was among the first to spring ashore. Silently, quickly, with beating hearts and held breath, the men followed. Then, as silently and quickly, the boats put off again for there had been room in them only for half the soldiers, and they returned to bring the rest. The climb up the narrow pathway began. It was so narrow in places that only one could go at a time, but every man was full of courage and hope. They struggled up as best they could, clinging onto bushes, rocks, roots of trees, anything that would give them the least grip for hand or rest for foot. A regiment of Highlanders were among the first to lead the way, for they were used to scrambling and climbing among the rocks of their homeland. Nearer and nearer to the top they came, unseen and unheard by the French sentinels above. But at last the rustling among the bushes and leaves down the slope caught their ear. What was that? they asked, and fired at random down into the darkness. But it was too late. The first soldiers had reached the height, Others followed after them, and terrified at the sudden appearance of men where they had thought no men could be, the French sentinels ran away. As soon as the British reached the top they fell into fighting order, and when day broke the sun shone on their red coats, as they stood drawn up in line upon the heights of Abraham, as the place was called. At first the French leader Montcalm could hardly believe that he saw a right. Then he said quietly, I see them where they ought not to be. We must fight them, and I am going to crush them. A fierce battle followed. Wolfe was struck in the wrist, but he tied his handkerchief round it, and went on fighting, and giving orders, as if nothing had happened. A second time he was hit. Still he went on. A third shot struck him in the breast. Then he sank to the ground with a groan. Wolfe was quickly carried out of the fight, but nothing could be done for him. He was dying. His officers stood sadly round him, when suddenly one of them cried, See! They run! They run! Who run? asked Wolf, opening his eyes and trying to raise himself. The enemy, sir, replied the officer. They are running everywhere. Thank God, said Wolf. I die happy. Then he fell back and never spoke again. The brave French leader Montcalm was also killed in this battle. So much the better, he said, when he was told that he was dying. I shall not live to see Quebec surrender. Quebec did surrender, and Canada was won. And ever since then it has belonged to Britain, and today it is one of the greatest of her colonies. A few days after Wolfe's sad letter reached home, another, both sad and joyful, followed. It told of the taking of Quebec, it told, too, of the death of the brave young leader. Not once or twice in our fair island story, the path of duty was the way to glory. He that ever following her commands, on with toil of heart and knees and hands, through the long gorge to the far light has won, his path upward and prevailed, shall find the toppling crags of duty scaled, are close upon the shining table lands, to which our God himself is moon and sun. Such was he, his work is done. But while the races of mankind endure, let his great example stand, colossal scene of every land, and keep the soldier firm, the statesman pure, till in all lands and through all human story the path of duty be the way to glory. End of chapter 94 Our Island Story, chapter 95 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Our Island Story, by H. E. Marshall Chapter 95 George the Third, The Story of How America was lost. George the Second died in October 1759 A.D., and was succeeded by his grandson, George the Third, 
whose father, the Prince of Wales, had died some years before. George the Third had been born in England, and seemed more of an Englishman than either George the First or George the Second. For that reason, and because he was young and handsome, the people were glad when he came to the throne. But he proved himself to be an unwise king, and it was during his reign that Britain suffered a great loss, the loss of all the American colonies except Canada. The wars which Britain had been fighting all over the world had cost a great deal of money. When Pitt saw a thing needed to be done, he did not stop to ask how much it would cost. He did it, and afterwards the country had to find ways and means of paying. War always costs a great deal, and the country had been fighting so much that it was now deeply in debt. The king's ministers, therefore, had to find some new way of raising money. It seemed to them that, As the war in America had been for the benefit of the colonies, the colonists ought to pay some of the cost. This being so, King George decided to tax the Americans. You know what a tax means. If a certain thing costs one shilling a pound, and the government said, We will put a tax of tuppence a pound on this thing, then it would cost one shilling and tuppence, and the extra tuppence would go to the government to help to pay the expenses of the country. for it requires money to keep up a country just as much as to keep up a house. You also know that the king could not make the people pay taxes without the consent of Parliament. That was a right for which the people and Parliament had fought over and over again, and which they had won at last. And if Parliament consented to a tax, it was really the people who consented, as the members of Parliament were chosen by the people. Now, the people of America sent no members to the British Parliament. When King George tried to make them pay taxes, they at once said, No, that is not just. It is against the laws of Britain. If we are to pay taxes, we must be allowed to send members to Parliament, as England and Scotland do. If we are to pay taxes, we must have a share in making the laws and saying how the money is to be spent. This was quite reasonable, but King George was not reasonable. He said no. The Americans were very angry at this, and they made up their minds to do without the things which the king wanted to tax. This was very hard for them, especially as one of the things taxed was T. 